So we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. And uh, we're going to go around the table here and just take introductions. Um, if you would just state your name and uh, business that you own or um, your, uh, your boss that you work for or uh, whatever you'd like to say about yourself, why you're here, you know, what's your interest? Are you interested at, you know, as a homeowner? Are you interested as a business owner or both? Yeah, Jim Waters with the Woodgrass Institute. Nick Bogorodetsky, local businessman. Natalia Bogorodetsky, owner of Realistic Company. Dorita Ward, I sell real estate just starting. <laughs> uh, Doug Gesford, I'm the president and CEO of Gateway Manufacturing, and I'm here both from a private citizen and from a local businessman perspective. Peter Mandrell, uh, own and operate Gateway Printing and Signs here in Mount Sterling, here also uh, for Ken Miller, homeowner. Ken Siders, homeowner. I have been here four years. My home assessment has been frozen at that time. And I was just watching a few of the categories and the year really jump up. And I was wondering why. So I heard about this, decided to come. I'm Kelly Smith. I'm with the Bluegrass Dan Freeman, I really don't do anything constructive anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're here. <laughs> Thanks for coming out tonight, everybody. And uh, we're going to start with a, a little short summary about uh, why we're here. And um, obviously, our tax rates have been going up, our property tax rates. Uh, there's four different classes of property. We have our real estate property. We have our, our personal or tangible property, our uh, motor vehicle property, and our watercraft property. And um, since 2001, we've seen uh, increases as much as 552% by some of our special taxing districts when the law says that they're capped at a 4% uh, increase per year. Now the 4%, uh, there's two different uh, terminologies used. The first one is compensating rate. Compensating rate is deemed to be the same amount of revenue that would uh, be produced as in the preceding year, less net new property and new pro or, uh, net new property and personal property. So uh, when you're computing the compensating rate, you're not supposed to take into consideration uh, any other types of property other than the real estate property. Um, also, you're supposed to subtract from that your net growth in property. So if a, a new home is built in the community or a new business is built in the community, um, the value of that real estate uh, is, is what we call new property when it first comes on our books as an assessment. You're supposed to deduct that when you're computing the compensating rate. So the compensating rate, what that means in essence is that there's already a built-in revenue increase that takes care of that net new property. So as our communities grow, um, as our assessments increase, <coughs> the amount of the tax base also is, in, is increased because of the net new property, right? So, um, so the compensating rate does not necessarily mean no change in revenue, it just simply means the, the same change in revenue that's gonna take care of the new property if there is new property. Theoretically, if there is no net new property, um, then, then the amount of revenue raised in the preceding year would be the same amount of revenue raised this year. The other term is called the 4% rate. The 4% rate simply means a 4% increase in revenue above the compensating rate. Sometimes that's referred to as compensating plus four. Uh, in 1979, our General Assembly here in Kentucky got together and uh, wrote a house bill house, called House Bill 44. Um, it's been uh, codified as KRS 132.010. And uh, in, inside that, that statute, there's a little bit of muddy language uh, on section six um, that actually uses the word and instead of each as it refers to classes of property. So it says in there, uh, when you're calculating the property tax rates, um, in one line it says it, it, the intent is to separate, you know, calculate the rates independently of, of one another. And I believe that's a true intent. Otherwise, you know, we just have one property rate for all four classes of property. Um, and then in another line, in, the, in that same section 6, 132.10, it, it uses the word and, um, which could be, uh, you know, used uh, to, to, you know, mean a, a weighting of the rate. So if you have a, a rate d a difference between two rates, let's say you have a real estate rate of 6 cents and a personal property rate of 12 cents, you add them together, it's 18 divided by 2, it's 9, so 9 cents would be a weighted rate. Um, we do not believe the true intent of the law is to do that, is to uh, weight the rates, otherwise we would have one rate of tax. So um, that's referred to as the loophole that a lot of you may have heard about, uh, the loophole with House Bill 44. Um, 
we've got a 40, about a 40 plus page uh, presentation that goes in depth and, and discusses that and breaks it down. Uh, if you'd like a copy of that, um, I'd be more than glad to email it to you. I think it's also available on our Facebook page. Um, but that's kind of the, the, the short and skinny on the House Bill 44 is there's some language in there that's not as clear as we'd like to see it. And uh, in my opinion, it's going to require uh, something that, you know, the General Assembly, I guess, our legislators to, to get back together and, and maybe do an amendment um, to that in order to, to, for further clarification. Um, that what impact does it have on, on our community? Um, well, like I said, since 2001, we've seen some of our taxing districts, special taxing districts, increase their rates by more than 552%. Um, many of them, uh, most of them, in fact, have, uh, have taken rate increases of anywhere uh, from 25% up to the 552%. Uh, there's uh, several that, that have over 100% revenue increase um, since 2000. And if you uh, look at what the state and what the county have done, they've actually decreased uh, for the real property. Both of them have decreased the state's uh, rate. Tax rate has declined by 13.5%, and the county's rate has declined by 4% for real property. Uh, there's a handout in front of you that, that, that goes through that shows the tax history. And uh, for the personal property of the state, uh, there's no change in that. It's been set at... at uh, at the same rate since 2000, and then the county rate has declined by 3.5% for uh, personal property. Um, and you can see some of the other items there in the change column, and that shows the, the percent of change from 2000 to present year 2012, or the current fiscal year 2012 to 2013. We're going to go through uh, some of the other taxing districts tonight. We're going to be releasing and presenting our study. Uh, for the health district, also for the extension district, the fire district, and the ambulance district. We've already addressed the library district and the school district we will be addressing at our May meeting. Tonight we have with us a uh, guest speaker, uh, Mr. Jim Waters, the president of the Bluegrass Institute. And I'm going to go ahead and bring up Jim um, and let him share a little bit about the institute and how he uh, came to be involved with the institute. and. Uh, what uh, he's doing behind the scenes and also in, in front of the scene, on the scene, I guess you could say, for us as taxpayers. So uh, thank you very much, Jim, for being, being a part. Thanks. Nice to meet you. Yeah, thanks. First of all, I'm going to invite my colleague, Kelly Smith, to come up. She's our vice president of Strategic Partners, and uh, she's going to she's gonna say just a couple things about the Institute uh, before I come back. Thanks. Um, yeah, just sort of tell you a little bit about the Bluegrass Institute. It was actually founded by a gentleman who's own small business was located in downtown Bowling Green and overnight the city passed a large tax increase that hit just businesses located downtown and out of that he felt um, you know he, in looking at ways to sort of fight this um, he created the Bluegrass Institute it's Kentucky's first and only free market think tank um, so we've been around since 2003 but we're really here to leverage the work that you're doing and, and shine a light on how you are working at the local level to um, you know, make government smaller <laughs> and, and function more properly. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the Institute um, and then introduce Jim so he can do his further presentation. But more and more Americans and Kentuckians rightfully identify that the federal government's power over their lives is too invasive. A September 2011 Gallup poll found that 81% of citizens were dissatisfied with how America was being governed. Key findings of the poll included 82% of Americans disapproved of the way Congress is handling its job. 57% have little or no confidence in the federal government to solve domestic problems. Americans believe on average that the federal government wastes 51 cents of every dollar, which I think is relevant to what you're addressing here. And more recently, Gallup reported that 77% of Americans believe that the way politics works in Washington these days causes serious harm to America. This is why the Bluegrass Institute stands for good government, a limited and constitutional balance of power, individual liberty, free market capitalism, and an accountable government through transparency. We follow our mission of empowering citizens like you to take back their liberties by choosing winnable policy battles within the Commonwealth. We believe that empowering citizens to secure and win back their liberties will result in a return to the balance of powers that are the architects of our nation envisioned. We serve as the liberty voice in Kentucky's mainstream media, thanks to Jim's uh, media footprint, by providing trusted content and analysis on policy issues, and we force accountability and policy change through transparency as we did with taxing districts, over 1,200 taxing districts in the state. Turning taxpayer 
leaders and to citizen auditors. But as the 2012 election so painfully proved, these uniquely American ideals are losing steam under the weight of pro the progressive left's mantra of big government, crony capitalism, and one-size-fits-all solutions. From Washington, the American people are now hearing the mantra that our Constitution is outdated for a 21st century agenda. We hear the call that you didn't build that, or that your taxes need to be raised to spread the wealth around, and that Adam Smith's invisible hand of the free market must be puppeted by a political elite. It's not hard to imagine a world where these wrong-headed ideas come to fruition, because we're seeing the results every day. Ballooning debt, loss of buying power and choice, record unemployment rates, and shuttered businesses. Forbes magazine listed Kentucky as one of 11 death spiral states due to our debt. It's that serious. Senator Rand Paul once said about the Institute that we're Kentucky's real free market idea factory. We advanced public pension, we're advancing public pension reform this year, holding off fast track implementation of Obamacare, forcing government transparency, and shedding the light on the education union's stranglehold on learning options for Kentucky's next generations. Free individuals like you make all of that possible. And so we're here tonight to just learn about the Institute and please consider helping us grow and strengthen our impact. Um, if you're ready to change Kentucky, to innovate and grow our economy, to leverage all of our state's capital and to see the Commonwealth thrive, we just ask you to please join in on us in our mission so that we can partner with you in advancing years as well. Um, at this time, I'll introduce Jim. Jim is president of the Bluegrass Institute. Um, he spent two decades in newspapers and radio stations as a reporter, editor, and anchor. Since coming to the Institute in 2003, since the very beginning, Jim has uh, been published statewide and in national publications and testified in D.C. and in Frankfurt. He's been in the Wall Street Journal. He's also appeared on CNN television. Um, his weekly column, The Bluegrass Beacon, appears in newspapers across the Commonwealth, including the Paducah Sun, Elizabethtown News Enterprise, the Danville Advocate Messenger, and the Corporate Times Trophy. So with that, I'll introduce Jim, and he can tell a little bit more about our initiative. Thanks. I want to thank Shannon too for what he's doing here and, and all of you all. Uh, this is so important that we know what's happening with our tax dollars and, and uh, you know th those, those are part of our property. When you talk about property rights you're talking about you know your tax dollars and how they're, how they're being used. So, uh, so I want to commend you all for the work you're doing. And I was glad to be here for the library board meeting. I really got a an insight on uh, on on the library boards. I had I had been to some of the special tax and district meetings, but I hadn't been to a library board meeting for a while, and, and that just sort of reminded me about how important it is for citizens in their local communities and to stand up. Uh, we encourage the Tea Party groups. You know, we say you can't really do a whole lot about Obama, but you can do a lot about the taxing district or about the tax rates or about local regulation or nanny government nanny laws local smoking bans and those type of things so we're encouraging people to stand up on local issues uh, because one thing about it your local commissioners and judges and, and magistrates and county judges and bureaucrats they have to look at you in the grocery store and <laughs> in sunday school and you know and so uh, people that go to frankfurt or washington they can escape that but people in the local level making those decisions they have to you know, you have a lot of contact and you have a lot of influence there. So never forget that and never let anybody tread on that. You have a right to stand up for what you believe in. And that's what the Bluegrass Institute really is all about. This is our 10th year. Uh, we're celebrating 10 years this year. We have some big things planned for later this year. But uh, we are working on some specific policy areas that we believe are Kentucky's greatest and most important challenges. A lot of times when I talk to groups like this, I, I talk about a specific issue. Uh, sometimes we talk about our pension system, uh, which is in a crisis. By the way, did you know that our public pension system in Kentucky has a $34 billion, that's with a B, $34 billion unfunded liability? And uh, they did nothing to fix that problem during this session, although they're traveling around the state. They want credit for doing that for their next campaigns. Uh, but the Bluegrass Institute has been standing up and saying you did not fix the problem and you will not fix the problem until you have some courage to do so. Uh, or sometimes we talk about the state's public education system. We were talking about a little bit about that earlier. But we believe that every child, no matter what your education or no matter what your income or where you live or your zip code, every child has a right to a great education. 
and has the right to the kind of education that will prepare them for the next century, for this, for this century. Or sometimes we'll talk about how states with right to work laws, here's one for manufacturing, so how states with right to work laws like Indiana and now, can you believe it, Michigan? Michigan, the home of the Auto Workers Union, home of the UAW, is now a right to work state, but Kentucky is not. And we talk, we'll talk a lot of times about how that uh, creates the kind of economic growth that we only hear about here on the campaign trails. Or we'll talk about how that if we don't address the, obes uh, the obesity of our state's Medicaid system, that it's going to make it totally unable. Do you realize that in expanding Medicaid under Obamacare, which our governor is likely to do because he's one of his pals, but do you understand that when we do that, it's going to make the system totally unable to serve the people for whom it was originally created. And that is the truly poor and disabled among us. They will not be able to get the care. And then the people that are being added to the system think they're going to get great care. Or we'll talk sometimes about how government regulators at the EPA, you know, they're determined to destroy Kentucky's coal industry. Or how the smoking nannies and the government do-gooders, they want to control every aspect of your personal life from cradle to grave without any respect for your private property rights, your individual freedom, or your personal responsibility. But we could talk about any one of those specific issues. But what I'd like to do for just a few minutes if I can this evening, and I think this will really help you because no matter what the issues are, there we offer a broad set of, of uh, principles that apply to every issue, whether it's a tax and spending issue, a budget issue, a pension issue, whatever it is. And so tonight I want to give you quickly seven principles of sound public policy for Kentucky. We call them seven pillars of freedom. And uh, now, and, and, and this, by doing this presentation, you'll find out what the Bluegrass Institute really is about and what our principles are. In fact, the seven principles of sound public policy was the founding document of the Bluegrass Institute back 10 years ago that Kelly referred to. And they really represent the, one day I was sitting there and I'm thinking about these principles and I thought, wait a minute, these aren't only the principles of the Bluegrass Institute, these are the principles of our whole country, <laughs> that our whole country and our whole commonwealth was founded upon. So to kind of illustrate where I'm going, I want to tell you a true story tonight. It's a true story. It comes from testimony that was offered in Washington some years ago in front of a congressional committee by a developer from Louisiana. Well, this developer was planning a new development, a new project, and at one point, this developer found out that he had to get the approval of no fewer than 23 local and state agencies before he could even begin to build this project. And then just when he thought everything was done and ready to go, he learned he had to apply for approval from the Department of Housing and Urban Development in Washington. Right. So he and his attorney filled out all the required forms, sent them off to the Housing and Urban Development Department, and he gets this reply from the federal agency. Quote, we received today your letter in closing application for your client in support of abstract of title. We have observed, however, that you have not traced the title to the property previous to 1803. Before final approval can be granted, you must trace the title previous to that year. Well, the developer and his attorney were irate at this bureaucratic foot dragging, so they fired off their own letter to HUD the following day, and they said, here's what the letter said, said, dear gentlemen, your letter regarding title has been received. I noted that you wish title to be traced further back than I have done. Well, I was unaware, he wrote, that any educated man failed to know that Louisiana was purchased from France in 1803. The title to that land was acquired by France by right of conquest from Spain. The land came into the possession by Spain by right of discovery in 1492 by an Italian sailor named Christopher Columbus. The good Queen Isabella had taken the precaution of securing the blessing of the Pope of Rome 
upon Columbus's voyage before she would sell, sell, uh, sell her jewels to help him. The Pope, in turn, is the emissary of Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. God made the world. I think it's safe to assume that God created that part of the world known as the U.S., and that part of the U.S. known as Louisiana, and I hope to hell you're satisfied. <laughs> I think that sort of sums up what the message has done. Now, these principles that I want to give you, and it's not going to take long, but they're not original with me. They're simple. You've heard them all before. You'll recognize them. And these aren't all the principles that are important to freedom and prosperity in Kentucky, but I do think they're some of the most important. And they are simple, but they are not simplistic. My friend Larry Reed, who, is, who was the president of the Mackinac Center in Michigan, he said that in his view, these are eternal principles that should form the backdrop of what we do as policymakers inside and outside of government. If every cornerstone of every government building in Washington, in Frankfurt, and in Mount Sterling were emblazoned with these principles, and every Kentucky legislator, magistrate, and commissioner and county judge would remind themselves of these principles every single day during the next year, Kentucky would be freer, stronger, more prosperous, and far better governed. Principle number one, free people are not equal, and equal people are not free. Free people are not equal and equal people are not free. Now I'm not talking here about equality before the law. Now I know our judicial system doesn't always work like you would like and like I would like for it to do. But we have a bedrock of Western civilization which is equality before the law. We are, as John Adams said, a nation, a government of laws and not of men. But what I'm talking about here is not legal equality but economic equality. We are not equal people in terms of income and material wealth. Are we not different in terms of talent, in terms of industriousness, in terms of a willingness to work? Don't you know some people who are willing to work harder than others? In terms of savings? Now some people have different talents, some have more ability, some have different desires. Some don't ever really discover their real talents until later in life. Some don't ever discover them. That's kind of sad. But I was thinking about Colonel Harlan Sanders. Colonel Harlan Sanders was 65 years old when he took $105 out of his first Social Security check and he began visiting all these little franchises, some of them were run down, to promote his Kentucky Fried Chicken. Ray Harper, John Calipari, Rick Pitino are exceptionally talented basketball coaches. Should it surprise anyone that they make more money coaching basketball than all other Kentuckians could probably ever hope to achieve? What's the point? We're different. In a free society, people are free to be themselves, to determine their own fates, their own directions in life. Some are more industrious, some willing to work harder than others. J.L. Turner had only a third grade education, but in 1939, J.L. Turner figured out something. You know what it was? He figured out that buying right gave his customers a bigger incentive to shop at his discount retail store in Scottsville. It was known as Dollar Gym. And it sprouted into one of the largest retail chains in the country. In fact, you see them all over now. But there was only one jail turn. There was only one Colonel Sanders. And there's only one Rick Patino. And I used to say that some people might be thankful for that, but now that they've won the championship, I'm going to be careful. But, but in a free society, simply because people are free to be themselves, there will be vastly different levels of income, and individuals will accumulate different levels of wealth. Now, we hear about this, don't we, this gap between the rich and the poor from Washington and government and politicians? But I would submit that people being themselves is a good thing. Every one of us is a separate, unique individual with different abilities and different ambitions. Free, considering the alternative, people being themselves is a good thing. It's not only a good thing, it's the right thing. Another area we're different in is in terms of our savings. Just think about it. Even if we were all the same in terms of talent and work ethic, those similarities would completely disappear when it comes to our different approaches to savings. How many of you think that President Obama, if he could, could, would snap his fingers and make us all equal in terms of wealth and income today? But I guarantee you one thing. 
we would be unequal by this time tomorrow, even if he could do it. Why? Because some of us would save it, and some of us would what? Spend it. Free people simply won't be equal in terms of wealth. But the second part of that is even more important. And that is free people are not equal, and equal people will not be free. Show me a people anywhere on this globe in history who were equal economically, and I'll show you a very unfree people. Why? Because the only way you could even have the remotest chance of equalizing income and wealth across society is to put a gun to everyone's head. And you would have to give orders, backed up by the bullet, that, that would say something like this, don't excel, don't work harder or smarter than the next guy, don't save more wisely, don't be there first with a new product, don't provide a good or service that people might want more than your competitor is offering. This actually has come close to happening in history. There was a small country, we use Cambodia because it's similar in size to Kentucky, or it's at least smaller than some countries, but it happened there in the late 1970s, Cambodia. Except for a few at the top who welded the power and they were well taken care of, most Cambodians lived in Stone Age-like conditions. Two million of Cambodia's eight million citizens lost their lives by dictators trying to make everybody equal. So just remember that the next time you hear some politician or some talking head opine about the unfair gap between the rich and the poor and how government needs to do something about it. No. Show me anywhere on this globe where people are equal economically or where government has tried to make that happen, and I'll show you a very unfree and poverty-stricken people. Free people will not be equal, and I guarantee you equal people will not be free. Second principle is this. What belongs to you, you tend to take care of. What belongs to no one or everyone tends to fall into disrepair. If you want to trash the wealth of a society very quickly, how can you do it? Just take what belongs to those who created it and give it to those who did not. Just ignore private property rights. We were talking about this. Make everything common. The result will be fewer people will have the incentive to create more, and most everybody will have an incentive to use and even abuse what is there. This explains what happened in the old Soviet empire, why it collapsed. They said, we'll own everything. We'll be in charge of it. We'll operate it on behalf of the people, and everyone will be a part owner. So what was once the farmer's food became the people's food, but the people went hungry. What was once the entrepreneur's factory became the people's factory, and the people had goods that were so shoddy that there wasn't even a market for them outside of their sorry borders. Now some collectivist thinkers and socialists will tell us, Oh, well, you have to break an egg sometimes to make an omelet. The only problem is they never make any omelets. They only break <laughs> eggs. And in the end, what happened in the Soviet Union was a prescription for economic and ecological disaster. Resources are not cared for unless somebody can say, that is mine. That's just the way human nature is. I mean, think about it. When's the last time you washed the rental car before you returned? How many renters take care of a property as well as they would if their name was on the deed? What belongs to you, you take care of. What belongs to no one or everyone tends to fall into disrepair. Third principle is simply this. Sound policy consists of considering the long-term effects and all people, not just the short-term effects and a handful of people. As my friend Larry Reed says once again, he says, so much of what happens in our legislature and in Washington and even at City Hall is in direct violation of this principle. Think about it. This principle is usually violated in one of two ways by politicians. One is politicians will get all excited about tax incentives have you heard? <clears throat> and other goodies that will help this group over here, but they never look at what the effects might be on everyone else. I like a tax increase, huh? Well, did it fit this group? What about everybody paying it? So just a look at what happened in this so-called pension fix that happened in the legislature this past session. They protected government workers, they protected the status quo, and guess how they did it? They did it by raising taxes and by snatching millions of dollars out of Kentucky's road funds. 
The bill they passed applies only window dressing to Kentucky's $34 billion unfunded pension liability. And as Dr. Brian Strau, a member of the Bluegrass Institute Board of Scholars, he noted in an op-ed that we released, he said the Commonwealth needs an additional $1.1 billion annually to fix the unfunded liabilities in its pension and retiree health care programs. Did you get that? $1.1 billion. Senate Bill 2 that they passed and they're crowing about, it raises $100 million a year and does nothing to make the system transparent, to get rid of corrupt legislative pensions, or fix the structural problems that brought us to this point in the first place. In fact, it did nothing about the Kentucky teachers' retirement system, which is, are you ready for this? More than $11 billion in the hole, just in that one fund. And there are six public pension funds in Kentucky. So what do our political leaders in Frankfurt say about this legislation? Oh, we fixed the problem when all they did is put a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. What they really did was they fixed the ability to go home and campaign for the next re-election claiming we did something about this problem. They said the same thing back in 2008, by the way. Five years ago, I went back and looked at the quotes. They were almost identically the same as we heard this year. We, they tinkered around the edges of the program and then they claimed we fixed the problem. The voting block of government workers will probably be pleased. Taxpayers will still be responsible for the lion's share of the retirement benefits, while workers are still guaranteed a 4%. How would you like that? A guarantee on your investments, a 4%. Well, and then the second way this is violated is that politicians take care of the problem <coughs> for the moment instead of taking care of it for the long term. Now, we all know, don't we? Sometimes you can fix a problem for the moment, a leaking roof, you can stop it from leaking temporarily, but it doesn't fix the problem, does it? Unless you put a new roof on or do something dramatic. But the way they fix it, that's the problem. We saw this when Lyndon Johnson created the Great Society. It aroused the notion that some people would benefit from a welfare check. Some of those policies may have fixed some problems in the short term, but in the long run, many of those federal entitlement programs have encouraged a lack of productivity, dependency upon government, it's cost taxpayers a fortune, and its long-term effects have been very harmful. Was this not what happened with the so-called stimulus funding? Remember how we were promised that stimulus dollars would be used to get people back to work? Oh yes, on shovel-ready projects within 60 days. Well, 14 months later, the city of Louisville had received $458 million, twice as much as they expected. I, I'm trying to figure out how you get twice as much as you expect on that, you know? But they created a new, a new position called the City Stimulus Czar. City Stimulus Czar. Rick Johnstone, he enthusiastically reported that the stimulus funds will result in 1,152 jobs. But we do the math at the Bluegrass Institute, so you don't have to. And when we did the math, we figured out $458 million spent on 1,152 new jobs works out to $397,569.44 per job created. I think the nation's, I think the nation's <laughs> economy would have been better off in Louisville's economy and Kentucky's economy. If we had just sent all the citizens a $20,000 check and let them decide how to spend it. Folks who were unemployed, they could have used the money to go back to school, learn a new trade, go to work, pay taxes, buy things, make investments, save for the future. It would have been a true economic stimulus. After all, it was their money in the first place. But so much of this is just a lack of thorough thinking. If a thief goes from bank to bank in Mount Sterling, stealing all the cash he can get his hands on. And then he goes and he spends it at the local shopping center. You wouldn't be very thorough in your thinking, would you? If all you did was survey those store owners and conclude that this guy stimulated our economy. John Maynard Keynes was a famous economist of the last century whom I don't have much agreement at all. He was actually the architect of many of our big government programs that we have today. Someone once asked him, said, Mr. Keynes, if we follow your advice and government gets bigger, spends more, runs the printing press, runs deficits, won't that mean the dollar will go down in value or maybe even become worthless someday? To which Mr. Keynes famously replied, well, in the long run, we're all dead anyway. <laughs> well, how tragic. 
that we live in a time when so many policymakers seem to be saying, if it helps us, makes us feel good, why not? Somebody down the line gets the bill, we'll be gone. Henry Hazlitt said, today is the tomorrow that yesterday's bad policymakers said we could safely ignore. If we were thorough in our thinking, we would implement more sound policy that considers the long run effects in all people, not simply the short term effects in a few. I, I challenge you the next time one of your senators comes here and holds up one of those big fake checks or one of your congressmen from Washington says, look what I brought home for you. I dare you just to be real polite, but, but right there at the press conference say, yes sir, and who paid for that? <laughs> if he's honest, he'll say, the only reason I could bring this home here is because I had to vote for goodies for another lawmaker to take home, and in the end, you and I pay for them both. The fourth principle is this. If you encourage something, you get more of it. If you discourage something, what do you get? Less of it. That's why it's so important for Kentucky to have real tax reform. Why does Kentucky still have an income tax, by the way? Well, I think it's because too many of our policymakers don't understand this principle. The more, and this applies right to what you're talking about with your local, the more you tax a certain activity, the less of that activity you're going to get. If you want to have less property, less savings, less work, less investment, less risk taking, then all you have to do is tax those things until the expected rewards are exceeded by the cost and by the risk. Incentives and disincentives really do affect our behavior. For much of the last year, and even during this year's legislative session, we heard folks in Frankfurt talk about raising taxes on certain groups of people to raise more revenue for the government. That's what we're going to do. We're going to raise taxes so government can have more money to spend. Well, amazingly, the so-called Tax Reform Commission, put together by the governor and lieutenant governor, was filled with people who either make their living off taxpayers or who believe that Kentuckians and Kentucky businesses are not paying enough in taxes. What amazes me is that their revenue estimates of how much additional revenue tax hikes will bring in never assumes, never assumes, that people will change their behavior because of tax increases. That's why we hear folks in it, that's why we hear about past uh, past events like half, uh, during George W. Bush's term. Remember that George H. W. Bush, first first George Bush. Remember that? About halfway through his term, the president said, "What? Read my lips." What did he say? No, no, no new taxes. Yeah. But he ended up caving in to the Congress and he agreed to raise taxes. So, in 1990, taxes were raised, but only on certain items: boats, aircraft. Jewelry, and I was reminded of Bowling Green classic cars or whatever that is. Ah, taxes were actually raised on those too. Why those items? Well, because rich people buy those items. And so they can afford to pay more taxes, right? But listen, when you raise taxes, you create another set of incentives centered around how to avoid paying those tax hikes. Yet policymakers don't consider that tax increases do more than just affect the one particular target group. So they say, well, raise taxes on the rich, but, and so government will have more money, but they don't consider all the consequences of their decision. In fact, the target group in that case in 1990, guess what those folks quit doing? They quit buying. What they quit buying? Boats, jewelry, aircraft, classic cars, whatever. And as a result, only about half of the expected income from those tax increases actually came into government coffers. $31 million in new revenue that year was expected from these tax increases alone, those. But only about $16 million actually came in. Yet the government paid out more than that in additional what? Unemployment benefits. To whom? To the people thrown out of work in those industries that made what? Boats, aircraft, and jewelry. Only in Washington can you aim for 31, get 16, spend 24 to get it, and say, we have done a great day. <laughs> the reason? Raising taxes creates a whole lot of disincentives. We've recently did a Medicaid study in which we found out that from 1999 to 2009, the number of Kentuckians enrolled in Medicaid increased by 39%. 
Kentucky's general fund on Medicaid increased by 37%, and yet our state GDP, our growth, increased by only 8%. Free healthcare service crowds out the private alternatives. It subsidizes dangerous and unhealthy behavior. We've seen the wrong incentives in place. People are affected by incentives. What you encourage, you get more of. What you discourage, you get less of. Number five, nobody spends somebody else's money as carefully as he spends his own. That's the fifth principle. Nobody spends somebody else's money as carefully as he spends his own money. Did you ever wonder how the government could spend $600 on hammers or $800 on toilet seats at the Pentagon? When you could walk down the streets of this county and this place and you ask people if they would gladly spend their money in such a manner, why they would laugh at you, wouldn't they? Why does it happen though? It's because the spender is spending somebody else's money and not his own. Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman once said there's only four ways to spend money. One is you spend your money on yourself. Now when you do that, you might make some occasional mistakes, but you're not gonna make too many mistakes. They're gonna be few and far between for most people. Why? Because the connection between the one who earned it, the one who spends it, and the one who reaps the final benefits pretty strong when you're spending your own money. The second way you can spend it is you can use your money to buy someone else a gift. Now, when you do that, you do have an incentive to get your money's worth, but you might not end up getting something the recipient really wants. This is my theory on where bridal registries came from. <laughs> because at one time, you know, you know, the bride and groom would start opening their gifts and they'd have like 400 toasters. You know, so yeah, they were gifts, but you know. And then thirdly, you can use somebody else's money to buy something for yourself, like lunch on an expense account. So you might have some incentive to get the right thing, but little reason to economize. So if it's a choice between the lobster and the cheeseburger, you might go with the lobster, right? But finally, when you spend other people's money to buy something for yet someone else, that's the fourth way. You use somebody else's money to buy something for yet somebody else, then there is no connection between the earner, the spender, and the recipient, and that is where the potential for mischief and waste said Friedman is the greatest. Let's see, somebody spending somebody else's money on yet somebody else. Somebody spending somebody else's <laughs> money on, that's what happens in Frankfurt, Washington and at City Hall every single day. Nobody spends someone else's money as carefully as he spends his own. And the sixth principle, and perhaps the most important one, is government has nothing to give anybody except what it first takes from somebody and a government that's big enough to give you everything you want is big enough to what? Take everything you got. You guys are right on I wish every audience was you are great. Contrary to what some people may think, I have visited the Capitol in Frankfurt many times and in Washington a few times. And I actually, just to make sure I was right, I walked out behind the Capitol in Frankfurt, and behind the governor's mansion and behind the Capitol in Washington just to make sure that there weren't any trees out there growing with money on it. I can assure you, I didn't find it. And so, when you talk about, about where government gets its money, where does it get it? It can only take it from somebody else in the form of taxes. Or it crowds out other services, like how do they fix our pension system, fix? They raised taxes on the car credit you get when you trade in a used car, and they took money out of the road funds. Now, the Bluegrass Institute talks about reducing the size of government. Now, there are some people who think that that means that you're automatically anti-government, but they misunderstand. It reminds me of the man who lived in upstate New York he was getting tired of all that cold weather, so he decided that he was gonna go to Florida to visit. Well, his wife was on a business trip at the time, so he calls up his wife and he says, I'm gonna go to Florida, don't go back to New York, meet me in Florida when you can. Well, when he arrived, he thought he would send her an email and let her know that he was there. However, when he sent the email, he got a few letters wrong in the email address. And instead of the email going to his wife, the email went to a little elderly lady in Iowa whose husband had died the day before. 
This little lady turned on her computer, read the email, screamed and fainted right on the spot. Her family and friends were in there and they, in the other room they came running in and saw her on the floor. And when they read the screen, they understood why she fainted. The email said, dearest darling, just wanted you to know that I arrived safely. <laughs> Looking forward to you being with me tomorrow. <laughs> Sign your loving husband, P.S. It sure is hot down here. <laughs> <laughs> the Bluegrass Institute is not anti-government. Don't misunderstand. We do believe that we must, however, maintain an eternal vigilance over our government. George Washington gets credit for saying, government is not reason, it's not eloquence, it is force. Like fire, it can be a dangerous servant or a fearful master. I heard about this area of the country, and I wrote about this in a column one time. I heard about this area of the country where they were having, or this was actually in England, I think, they were having problems catching a herd of wild pigs that was destroying property. Wild pigs. And so they were at the local university and the professor asked the student, or the student asked the professor, do you know how to catch wild pigs? The professor thought it was a joke and the student said, no, it's no joke. He said, you catch wild pigs by finding a suitable place in the woods and putting corn on the ground. And then the students said the pigs find the corn and they come every day and they eat for free. When they get used to coming every day, put up a fence on one side of the place where they root. And when they get used to that fence, what do they do? They get used to the fence and they begin to eat the corn again. And you put up another side of the fence and they'll go away and then they'll come back. They get used to that, they start to eat again. And you continue until you have all four sides of the fence up with a gate on the last side. Well, the pigs are so hooked on the free corn that they come through the gate to eat. And then you slam the gate closed and you catch the herd. Suddenly, the wild pigs have lost their freedom. They run around inside that fence, but they can't get out. So they go back to eating free corn. By now, they're so used to it that they have simply forgotten how to forage in the wild. And in the end, they simply accept their captivity. Ironically, in the same year that our Constitution was ratified, a Scottish professor, Alexander Tyler, astutely predicted, a democracy can only exist until the voters discover that they can vote themselves largesse from the public treasury, and from that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidates promising the most benefits from the public treasury with the result that a democracy always collapses over loose fiscal policy, end quote. Amen. The naive among us, the politicians and their sheep-like followers claim that free corn, tax incentives, cell phones, nice three <laughs> <laughs> you know, welfare checks. I remember seeing the big, large lady on election night when Obama got elected. I'm going to get a check. They're naive. And they say, and they'll tell us, oh, public subsidies, government handouts, government bailouts, Welfare, it's just not inevitable, it's essential. Well, of course, feasting on a pile of corn placed on the ground is easier than foraging in the woods. Easier it may be, but free it is not. Government has nothing to give anybody except what it first takes from somebody. And a government that's big enough to give you everything you want is big enough to take absolutely everything you've got. And then the seventh and final principle, and the shortest one, is this. Liberty makes all the difference in the world. You know, this is great what you're doing. Because we cannot assume that liberty will always be ours just because it's always been. You know, it's amazing to me, Shannon, how we see it other countries, other societies, moving in the direction of our founding principles of freedom, limited government, individual liberty, 
economic prosperity, and at the same time, the nation that those principles was founded upon is drifting away in the other direction. We must return to those principles. That really is what the Bluegrass Institute is about. It's about returning to the principles of our founding fathers, whatever the issue. Principles of economic prosperity, individual liberty. Here's one, personal responsibility and a respect for the lives and property of others. We are committed to advancing freedom, defending liberty, and building a more prosperous Kentucky. Will you help us do that? Are you committed to that? Our founder said, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. We're here tonight because we're willing to pay this price. Are you? Thank you very much. You all be great. Just a minute or two for any questions or comments. So we're glad to be here tonight. We'll be around. I don't want to take a lot of time. You know, just one with the religious slant. I, I think the least attended to commandment is thou shalt not covet. Not your neighbor's cattle, not your neighbor's wife, not your neighbor's whatever. Covetousness, one thing someone else's something. Yeah, yeah. Is that's a good point. I mean, wanting and, and a lot of people want to use the government to take that from their neighbor and give it to themselves. You know, they want to use government policy to to take from someone who has earned it. You know, we heard that with and Kelly mentioned about um, you didn't build that. That's not yours. You know, type of thing. And and uh, that's that's what that is. That's really coveting. But here's the thing: is that people don't realize is what you encourage, you get more of. What you discourage, you get less of. So if we discourage entrepreneurship. Wealth creation, you know, freedom. We discourage people, innovation. We're going to get less of it, and we're going to pay a terrible price. We already are. So, yes, it's, it's, your points are really very, very good. It seems like, you know, our government leaders, we just don't have the proper perspective that we want to try to hold down cost. You know, I remember looking and complaining to our legislators here in Kentucky about the cost of building a school. I could have Doug build a school and meet all the standards. I change the standards and meet all the standards and save twenty percent from what a school district can do. But you know why? You know what that twenty percent is? Yeah. It's called prevailing wage. Right. Yeah, we are right. forced to pay. You know our school, that's a great example. We spend millions of dollars. We have got we have got we need five hundred million dollars in Kentucky to build the schools that are needed and to repair crumbling schools. Mm -hmm. If we suspended prevailing wage just for a year or I think it's a year. No, I'm sorry, two. If we suspend a prevailing wage just on school projects for four years, we could pay for it all. It's $125 million. And one of the problems with that prevailing wage is they'll say, they know that a mason is going to make good money. So they'll, they'll put the prevailing wage for a mason maybe at $36 an hour, but put a laborer with no skills up there, $20 an hour, $25 an hour, yep. when you can buy all you want for a lot less. So it just, it's well, just let me, let me, and the legislature yep. said, that's not the problem. Your problem is you don't ask for enough money. Come on, guys. No, that's you're not a problem. You just waste <laughs> it. That's not a problem. Yeah, that, yeah, part, but part of that issue is the fact that that, that self-fulfilling prophecy. That if a business wants to uh, go to a community and start a company, they try to go get CDBG funding, which is Community Development block Grant. Yeah. But again, you have to pay prevailing yeah. wage. So yeah. the government's giving you money that it took from everyone. Yeah. And it right. says you have to spend it using union well, let me, wages, I want to tell you, which sir, right. feeds the government. I'm going to tell you a quick, just a yeah. real quick story that we we succeeded on stopping one of these. It's called a project labor agreement, where you know that there was it was in uh, that wasn't here, was it? No, that wasn't here. It was where was it? Anyhow, it was in Eastern Kentucky, so on, on Eastern. Uh, but there was a there was a uh, I think it was an electrician. He, lit, he had done the work for the school district all his career. He was like been in this business for like 30 years. He, they were gonna build a new, a new elementary school, which is a significant cost and a big job. Well, he, can, he could see where the school was gonna be built. And he has done the work for the school system all their life, but they implemented what was called a project labor agreement, which forced all the people on the project to join a labor union and pay into the dues, even though they would not receive that once the project was over with. 
So here's a guy who's worked for 30 years on, with the school district. He was shut out of the process, or they were going to shut him out if they would succeed. And he could see where the school was being built. And they're bringing in people working. Well, they went to court and stopped it. Thank goodness. And the Bluegrass Institute helped people across the state know about it. It's been a little while, a few years ago. But that's what we can do when, when I love what you're doing. I want to I want to make sure I say that before I leave because every individual American has has the right and power, you know. And when you stand up, and they did in that community, the people stood up. They said this isn't right, and they talked to the Bluegrass Institute about. It. We helped them, so that's a great example of how we can work together on a local issue. But yeah, that's right. Take it. You know, you get the block grant money, and you have to waste twenty percent of it on paying higher wages than should be paid. And people can still make a great living even without that. But but it's a terrible waste of taxpayer dollars. And the thing is, the private sector businesses are shut out of that process. Because if they try to get involved, they have to give up all their proprietary information, all their competitive information. And so the private businesses say, we're just not going to compete. So we have a real problem with that area. But I love what you're doing, because that what happened in that little community, I'm, I apologize, I forgot the name of it. I'll think of it when I'm done here. But, uh, but but the local people said, when a, when a guy who's been working for the school district for 30 years can't get the bid because of this type of agreement, there's something wrong with that picture. And if more Americans would just stand up, more Kentuckians would just stand up and say to their legislature, you didn't fix the problem, we sent you there to fix the problem, and if you don't fix it, we're gonna send somebody else there to fix it. Why can't we do that? What are we afraid? Don't be afraid to say that, say it to them. You know, I do it all the time. So, your, uh, anyway. your comment about uh, when, <clears throat> when you don't own it, you don't take care of it. You see that every day in both private and public sector. Uh, show, show me anything that has CO in front of it. CO truck, CO car, <laughs> CO, CO building. Yep. Uh, the, the, library, the library complaining about their toilets yep. being clogged. Yep. I mean, the, the, the problem is, is people really don't take care of stuff when they don't feel they own it. Yeah. And and that's part of the issue. The other thing you said about uh, government, you know, government uses a 12 foot wide paintbrush whenever they try to paint anything. That, that's why government doesn't work because they can't use a fine brush to fix a problem. They use this large brush. And one of the biggest examples is when we enacted, when we enacted Medicare. When we enacted Medicare within two years, every one of the very large corporations which used to pay the medical bills for their retired employees until they died said why should we do that if the government is going to provide medicare and they stopped it all and if you look at any pension plan right now there the medical is covered until age 65. so again a private sector business is not going to waste money for a thing that doesn't give them any advantage and cost them money. So the, the same thing going on with this health care. You know what we do? They said 32 million people were without health care and we're going to fix it. Well, what they say now, it's going to cost us $2 trillion and we put another 12 million people on the medical rules. Well, what about the other 28 million that we didn't get, or the other 18 million we didn't get? And we're still going to pay for it the way we have always yeah. paid for it within the GK. And I'd like to encourage you, this information you got here is great. I mean, if people knew this tax information, and you're right, well said, if people knew how much their tax rates would drop, you know, if the right thing was done, I think you'd have a revolution on your hands here. And you could have, you could attract all kinds of business and economic opportunity here. So, you know, a lot of this is just people finding out and don't just rely on your local paper or whatever. Use social media, you're using Facebook. You know, those tools are the greatest tools for freedom, I think. The internet was the greatest tool for freedom ever created. Can it be used for wrong? Absolutely, just like anything. But we can use that. I mean, I've seen that used to start movements, to get the word out to people on issues, and people are paying attention to that. So I commend you all. I wish every community was doing as great as you were here. We'd, we'd have a different commonwealth. But keep up the good work. and. I'll be around if you have questions, or uh, I'll be glad to give you my contact information. So thanks again. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give Jim a hand real quick. So 
So tonight we're going to uh, release our studies for the health district, the extension district, the fire district, and the ambulance district. And then we have some other items of business. First, I'd like to uh, make mention on the uh, handout that you have before you. The uh, disregard, or if you want to, just go ahead and draw a line through the section that says... Uh, motor vehicle tax rate actual and watercraft tax rate actual and also the revenue from watercraft and revenue from all uh, and the revenue from motor vehicle uh, or just disregard those those rates I copy those from a, a different spreadsheet from the library spreadsheet so those rates are incorrect for the uh, extension district the fire district and the ambulance district the, uh, the motor vehicle rates are incorrect the watercraft rates are incorrect, and then there's an, it, it says from all, so just go ahead, that would, that would in turn make that incorrect as well. And I do have a revised version, it's already available, I haven't published it yet to the website, but I'll publish it and send out a link and an email, so you guys will have the, you, you, can, you can print another copy if you'd like, but other than that, the best of my knowledge, everything else is correct here. Uh, the data on the data pages um, was all pulled from the, uh, property uh, value administrator tax roll here in Montgomery County, as well as the Mount Sterling Advocate newspaper archives, and uh, some of the local special taxing districts also contributed to some of this data. So that's, uh, that's where we got the data from. Uh, the data should be the same for each of them. Uh, the only thing that's going to uh, vary on each of these is going to be the real property tax rate and the personal property tax rates, and then the amount of revenue collected for each. So I'd like to go ahead and start with the health district. I believe that's the very last page of the handout. And um, if you will just turn to that page, the last page of the handout. It says uh, 2012 health district real estate tax rates. Um, I've given some examples here. There's about 10 or 11 examples of what some of the, uh, the counties are charging for their health uh, district real estate tax rates. These are obviously the lowest in the state. Um, I wanted to use them as a benchmark because I think uh, that the closer we can get to zero on our tax rates, the better off we are. Um, one of my uh, legacies that I, I'd like to leave behind uh, is, is no property taxes. So, I mean, that's actually something I know it's a very bold initiative, but um, I'd love to, love to see it so that we didn't have to pay taxes on our real estate property and on our personal property as businesses. Could you imagine how much commerce would come to town if we were to, uh, to do away with the, with the tangible, the personal property tax? Um, you know, how competitive, how competitive that would make our, our local economy. And then, you know, uh, good grief, you know, people, we work our whole lives, you know, for this after-tax money that we then use to purchase our homestead. Wouldn't it be great if we had a, a homestead exemption that was a far more generous than 34,000 uh, but it came immediate, you know, with home ownership and, and the, in the sense that you didn't have any property tax maybe on your primary residence. Just some ideas and thoughts out there. But back to these, these, uh, these rates, like I said, these are the lowest, uh, to my knowledge, uh, health district real estate tax rates in our, in our state. Uh, we see here Muhlenberg, Jessamine, Boone, uh, so you know you're on the right page there. Uh, they range between uh, 1.8 pennies uh, to 2.2 pennies per hundred dollars of real estate value. Montgomery County right now is at five pennies per hundred, so that's uh, five cents per hundred dollars of real estate uh, property. And um, you see here in parentheses, recommended rate of two cents. Uh, what, I, what I propose to the group, and if everyone is in agreement on, uh, we'll have some discussion here after, uh, after I present these studies. And um, you know, if you're in agreement on this, or if you're in a disagreement on it, we'd love to have some discussion about it. But um, based on my research, uh, which has been conducted over the past two years, uh, and looking at some other counties, how they calculate their rates, which the majority of them are being calculated the same way that we calculate our rates, <laughs> which come to find out is not correct. Um, so the, uh, the rates, these rates may even be lower than what, than what is being reported here. Uh, so, so do pay attention to that. But my recommendation, proposal to the group, is that our, the Montgomery County Health tax district reduced their rate uh, for all four classes of property from a nickel down to two cents. And um, I believe that uh, based on uh, my review of their budget, which uh, I, anybody that would like a copy of their budgets, we have uh, all the budgets available for all of our special taxing districts. I think we have something like 15 or 16 special taxing uh, districts. 
in, in, our, in our community in Montgomery County. And not all of them are, are attaching to the property tax rolls, but they are what we call a taxing district. But if you'd like a copy of any of those and you don't want to have to fill out an application with the local government to, to request a copy and then have to pay for the copy, we'd be more than glad to send you a link where you can download and print your own copy at no charge. Um, so that, uh, that recommendation is to reduce their rate from five cents to two cents. Um, as far as, you know, what's that recommendation uh, based upon? It's based upon, you know, some of the other counties are actually operating at that rate. So it's proven that we could run at that rate, um, or maybe even less than that rate, uh, in, a, in a period where the economy... And where, they're, and where they're spending this five cents right now. Correct. Yeah, like, for instance, in the budget, there's a line item in there where they're spending, uh, I believe it's $188,000 we'll spend the current fiscal year on rent. Um, that's being paid from the health district to the health department. So the health district and the health department uh, are two separate entities. And the health district collects the tax and then rents the health department or health slash health district's building from itself. Kind of. So there's some, there's some stuff going on that when you look at the budget, just you know, pay note to that. Um, that was something that jumped out at me is you know, we're collecting this tax from the people and then we're, we're, we're using it to pay rent to this other right. entity that, that is essentially ourselves. Yeah, yourself. <laughs> um, on the, the first one, before you go from 2000 to 2012, uh -huh. um, and health is first. Okay, hang on a second. Which, which no, the very first? Oh, on the rates? Okay, yeah. yes. Um, it's at five now. It's at five. They've been at one. I want to go to two. Four. But it for 12 years has been four or above. Correct. That, that's a tremendous <laughs> amount of program development institutional uh, solidification that is going to be hard to shift. I mean, it, it, I, I, unless there is some huge something like- There's, like a, third, there's a third of it being paid in this rent. Yeah. But, yeah, but what's that used for ultimately? I mean, once the money is- Good well, question. Well, a new building, isn't it? Somewhere. Isn't it a new building? I, I don't know. That, that's yeah. a very good question. Yeah. That's the question we're asking. And, and for 12 years, they have to have been using nearly whatever they're using now, minus 25% 12 years ago. So they have institutionalized that. And I, well, one from five to two. Yeah, that's uh, a big job. I, I, I understand uh, compared to other counties, but that would be a really hard. Not, well, I would say, well, the children come to the library. You know, yeah. I mean, they're going to have, uh, they will have programs that right. are uh, heart tug, health, health and safety, or, you know, that, that's uh, deep seated in our responses. And yeah, they all do. Oh, do this they is some, some, another, another way that I arrived at that two cent rate real quick, Rick, is, is I did the uh, the spreadsheet where we, where we are going to address the extension service and some of these others. Uh, you'll notice on that one page there, I put that the, uh, the health, uh, district is not governed by KRS 132, which is the House Bill 44. Um, so the law is, is more lax with them. It essentially says that you, the health district, can, can set your rate to whatever you want it to be up to 10 pennies per hundred dollars. So you, you don't have a, I mean, that's pretty much the law. So they could say, well, we're going to be 10 cents this time. We're going to be two pennies this time. They can adjust the rate, you know, annually um, based on, on my research with it. Now, what I did is I ran that through the same spreadsheet as though, treating them as though they were governed by 132, like the like our other taxing districts. And what I came out with was a rate there around that two cents. I actually think it was like, I want to say 1.8 cents. Using the, compen using the compensating one, which says as your personal property grows, the tax to each individual that's part of the original property goes down because you're going to generate more money. So the dollars are up there. Remember, the thing you don't see when you look at rates is you don't see the actual revenue yeah. that's okay. that's collected. And that our assessments have done this. You know, I mean, since 2000, our assessments have. Mm. Been, I mean, you can you can look. That, at one that's of the part of the thing that makes made. it very hard to put anything on one sheet of paper, because uh, when even when Shannon, they, who's very knowledgeable about all this stuff. There was many times when he was talking, he used the term rate when he really meant revenue. We're almost done. It's compensating plus 4% revenue, not rate. Rate has nothing to do with what it is. Rate, were, rate is a calculation result of looking at the revenue stream. Right. So what it is, I actually ran that through that spreadsheet, and that's why it, it gave me, and if you want to see that spreadsheet, I can share it with you. I've got a link to it. But I did that prior to finding out that they're not govern under the same statute. So um, I thought that that was a fair approach though, so I did keep a copy of that. I said, well, if they were governed under, what would the rate look like today? And 
uh, based on our assessment growth, and, and uh, that's where it would be at is around that. So my question was, he, he said that they probably spent all their money. Do they have money in the bank? Um, a little bit, and, and uh, there's uh, you can go uh, to uh, do a search for Kentucky State Otter and go to their website, and there's a, uh, I think it says, uh, Tax, what's, what, do you know what it says on the right? Something citizen auditor or something like that on Adam's page. It's, yeah, it's, it's citizen auditor yeah. or something. There's a there's something. a link there, and if you go there, you can look at the at the at the amount of money they're supposed to have, the, the carry forward amount. Um, you know, and it should be reported. And of course, it's going to be different than what they actually have. Um, I'd encourage you just to call them and ask them how much money they have in the bank. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good luck getting an answer. Yeah. Uh, they'll say, well, why don't you come down and, and meet with us? No, they, they might be transparent, might give it to you over the phone. The health department. Have, have you met with the health department? I, I have not. Now, uh, uh, Mr. Tim Keenan has called me on uh, several occasions, and um, I do have two phone calls into him, have not received uh, responses, but um, I told him that, you know, that we're, I basically shared a two-cent rate. I said, we're going to ask you to, to reduce your rate. Uh, you know, what, what's in discussion at this time is from five cents to two cents, and I haven't heard any more from him. <laughs> um, but he was just kind of he was he was kind of asking around. I mean, kind of you know, curious. You know, what, what what's your take with the health department? Where how, how do you have you seen our budget? What's your thoughts on it? And, you know, questions like that. And um, I said, well, you know, I, I've seen it, but I haven't really dug into it yet. And, you know, when I dug into it, and I saw that big rent amount. You know, and it seemed like the bulk of their budget was paying rent to themselves. It's kind of like weird. And he's like, well, it's we're not we're two separate entities. You know, the health tax district and the health department. But yet, to the public, if you go out there and ask somebody on the street, they, they would think they're the same. You know, that when you see the health tax, it goes to the health department, right? So, well, what you were saying, I would just say you're right. I mean, it'd be a tough, that'd be a tough drop. But, but on the other hand, they need to know that you as citizens are, are paying looking attention. At so, even if they didn't lower it that much, they're going to be, you know, they know I you're think, watching how they're spending it. I think we learned. That, I think we learned with the library that even if you use the law. They're not going to listen to you. So, uh, I, you know, if you remember, if you remember, I was this guy that was kind of trying to mediate before. I'm not much for mediation anymore because we we get no respect. So <coughs> the big thing is, you go in there with that two percent. The first thing you say is, "Well, look, a third of your money that you collect, you pay rent on. Where does that go?" And you start using yeah, that yeah. as a uh, as a avenue to dig to find out what they're doing with that. How are they spending that? You know, how do they do they get do they get rent money from the uh, employment services because they're in that building that they're occupying? Are they getting additional money that we don't see because it's not a direct tax? So there's all sorts of questions, and I guess the problem is right now we don't get any respect. The only thing we get is is uh, accused of fear mar mongering. That's all we get. We get two minutes. Of well, you get yeah. two minutes. Yeah. 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 That's all we get is fear mongering. Please, please. And we get, you know, what Shannon said in a nice way was, well, what are you coming after us for is, is what we're getting from most districts. Because uh, when we went in to talk to the fire chief, it was like, at first, it was like we had to keep at least six foot of wood between us because he was pretty upset because what everybody's running on in each one of these special tax districts is rumors. It's really rumors. It, it seems to me we need some very simple um, but accurate way of boiling all this down to some one number, a change in 10 years, <coughs> or 12 years, say it's this kind of growth. It's something that will appeal to people through the papers. That that, that is. The well, leverage to get well, I think the if they would just follow the, letter, look, the, the if, true intent of the if law. If you look 4%. at this sheet of paper, what, the first thing I did when I printed these all up for Shannon was I looked at this paper and I said, my goodness, our real property tax in 2000 represented almost 1%, okay, which is, which is uh, one sixth of the maximum state income tax that we pay. So the whole state runs on 6%, and Montgomery County was running on 1% of real property tax, okay? And then you go over here and you add it up, and it's one and a quarter now. So they went up 25% as a whole from, from, from 2000 to 2012. And then when you include the personal property tax, now all of a sudden we went from 2%, two, 2 which is, you know, 100 pennies, 129 pennies or 130 pennies here and 100 pennies up above. Okay, so we went from two to three. 
150 pennies plus 100 pennies plus 25 plus 28. We went to 3%. It's no longer pennies when it's percents. You know? So we're at 3%. So that's half. That's half of the state income tax maximum that an individual pays for the county of Montgomery special taxing districts. That's a lot of money. Yep, that's a lot of money. Uh, I'm still good. Okay, sure. Yeah, I, I don't know what it is I'm missing, but if they have legal ability to charge up to 10 cents, I mean, what we... They work for us. They, we don't have legal. Yeah, they work for us. They are paying them. They yeah, need but, to but get I, that I, I mean, walk in there pretty... Would you lower your rates pretty please? On top and you're <laughs> no, do I don't think no, what you, you do, do what you do like is that. you do a recall vote. You do a recall vote. See, the problem is, is everybody has been asleep, mm -hmm. including mm -hmm. myself. Times have been so good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Everything grows every year. We don't worry about it. Well, now, the last five years, we ain't grown, but they have. Okay? Mm -hmm. They work for us, mm -hmm. damn it. <laughs> They get paid out of my money that I give them. With a raise guarantee. That they That's right. They, don't they get the paid way. by us. Economy. You don't have to say they, for they get paid by us, like but I don't think they, they work, work for us. That's right. They don't work for us. And you know why? Okay, how many people How many people are owners of a company or a manager? How many people think that they could be away for eight years and their employees would do what they're supposed to do. Okay? Or not eight years, 200 years. How often do you think that they would stray if their bosses weren't around? Well, it's about time that the public realizes that we're their boss. You know, I, I was very docile and I was trying to calm Shannon down, but after the episode with the library, damn it. It's my money. Yeah, I don't even want to. I mean, the law's already been, you know, two judges have already ruled if they're, well, let's hold that for that item of business yeah. on the, the yeah. agenda. But, um, so, the health district, uh, as with these others, um, you know, we're just going to make recommendations to them. They already know that we're looking at their budgets. I think we're going to see, I think we're, we're getting some traction. I think that we're going to see them, the rates, at least stay where they were this year. I think they're going to maybe freeze their rates or, or, or bring them down. I think what um, you're going to I'm see optimistic that is the minute, the, lawsuit, the, the minute the lawsuit is filed in Montgomery County, all of a sudden that adds legitimacy to this group. Yep. It means we're not going to be stepped on. We're not going to be walked over. We're trying to be reasonable. I mean, the letters, we were very careful with the second letter to make sure it was very, it was not condescending. It was not inflammatory. It was very matter of fact and cooperative in nature. But it wasn't something they wanted to hear. So I think the legitimacy happens as a result of us going after it. Yeah, I think you're doing well, and I think the purpose is good. Uh, I think it is important, though, to try to tell people in the community, like in your report here, where you're showing how out of balance we are with other communities in the scale. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think people don't know. Right. Well, they don't pay attention, so uh, okay, I just got to pay this tax and rumble a little bit and pay it. But if they need to look at it and say, gee whiz, you know, if, if, if we're yeah, way higher than the rest right, of yeah. these, and these are not just uh, poor counties around us, we could have some good ones to compare us to. Mm -hmm. So if they can do it, then what's wrong with Montgomery yeah, County? Can we do it? Exactly. If these exactly. guys drive down the street and gas is, is twice as much in Montgomery County as it is in Winchester, they're going to notice that. No. And that, like you said, comparison helps. Now, the library board may well have a problem. Cutting back down. You know, if you could put this in some graphical, you know, a graphic oh, ratio. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the other areas. I mean, in order so the shin at the end of this group doesn't come off looking like the big bad wolf. Right. You need to say, hey, look, guys, this is the problem. Yeah. We don't know what you have to do, but something has to be out of balance because if they can operate in these communities and have a successful program, then why can't we? Well, it's like our comparison with the state and with the county. When you look at the first page here, you know, look at state, look at county, their rates have came down since 2000. Part, you know, part well, of the why, problem why the other ones came down? Part of the problem with special taxing districts is it was very coy of the legislature or whoever did it to put it in terms of pennies. Because pennies are hard to fight. They're hard to fight. So not until you get into 100 pennies does anybody notice. But when you start adding them all up, there's a lot of pennies on the table. Mm -hmm. So the real problem is, that, like, they were very surprised when you brought up your property tax because it brought it home. You said, because I'm retired, 
my my housing property can't go up that's the law so for the last five years my property has not gone up in value and yet i went from 95 dollars and three years ago to 135 dollars in three years he basically increased by 50 40 percent yeah 40 percent in three, three years that's when it brings it home because you're right the pennies get lost but yeah you're right you have to show other counties and what they're doing about it. Yeah, when you ask them, you know, is that four percent? They'll say, well, that was four percent. You know, we took four percent. Well, how do you get how, how in three years of four percent growth? How do you get a forty percent in revenue? Four you know? percent growth yeah. in revenue. Yeah. yeah, I'm a big bug on looking at. I think we need for a successful community to have a lot of community services, but what we don't need is doing is just wasting money right. and, and spending money and building all kinds of bureaucracy that sometimes you really you don't need. Can I ask on that too? Another way to compare that would be other counties are aren't they offering similar services for a, right. a lot less for less tax dollars? Yeah. So they're showing that per they capita, can, they can per capita. Per, yeah, they're showing they can provide those services mm -hmm. at lower rates. Mm -hmm. So why can't we? Mm -hmm. If you look at our if you look at our our square no, sorry, no, if you look at our square miles no. and if you look at our population and compare those dollars to the Per capita or per uh, area, based on based on land usage, for those ones that are applicable to area and those based on population, we're paying a lot for our health care or for our health department. We're paying a lot. Yeah, we are. But the school district had a few years ago seven million dollars in reserve with the, with enough to reserve to pay off some debt because that would help their operating budget lower your cost if you make all those payments and then that smooths out your revenue for a long time uh, didn't pay off the debt I remember when I stepped down saying guys you need to because it's the, 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 everything was so unstable at the time just keep it in reserve uh, keep it invested you need to pay off these debts or you lower your rate but you need to pay off these debts before you do so that you get out so that you, so you don't need as much as you don't have those big payments they didn't make the payments they just paid off the debt yeah, spent the money. Well, I don't know. They spent a lot of it. it you can't find out. <laughs> That's the problem. Can't find out. <laughs> you just can't find out. Yeah. Budget I'll nonsense. tell you what, when it comes to the school district, I'd like to bring the state police with us <laughs> instead of them well, threatening to arrest us. I'd like to threaten to arrest them for not following well, There is the a law. state audit going on now kind of quietly, but uh, uh, this, I don't know. It's just uh, I've looked at the budget and it's, it's nonsense. So I don't know. I know they've hired a lot of people yeah. and they spend a lot of money, but that's not my business now. I just uh, am concerned. Is the school district your largest employer here? Yeah. Uh, no. 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 Nestle was number two. Nestle. 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 Yeah. I'm okay. behind Nestle. <laughs> but Nestle a lot of counties in Kentucky, the school yeah, system yeah, it is the largest. Especially when you go yeah. to east, uh, further east, you go to the yeah. Yeah. Right, that percentage. Yeah. Okay. Well, so moving right along, the uh, second page here on the handout. The 2012 Extension Service District real estate tax rates. Uh, once again, there's some more uh, counties. Next listed. time, you're going to put this PDF together <laughs> in order for me, <laughs> so it's not all over the place. I, I sent this to Doug Page two three. hours before the meeting, so he, uh, an individual PDF. An individual PDF, so he did the best he could. Do. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I, I listed some more counties up here, another 10 or 15 counties or so, Second just to kind of give us a benchmark of what their rates are for their extension district um, and what our rate is. Uh, you see, in Fayette County, it is. Uh, Three tenths of a penny, and uh, we are 4.7. Make sure everybody's on the same. Second page. Yeah. Second page is the second page of the handout. The second page of the handout. Well, let's see. Okay, yeah. so, so you see a 2012 extension service. You see that? Okay. So this is the real estate tax rates. Um, if you scroll down the list, you'll see Montgomery. We're at presently at 4.7 cents, and uh, Fayette County is at three tenths of one cent. Um, someone else that you know, Green Up is, is is less than half what we are. Uh, Madison County is a penny and a half. Uh, you know, so so some counties in here that, that hopefully you all recognize. Um, just showing what's possible, right? So the recommended rate here, uh, this is based on our study, should be oh, oh, one oh. one point one oh. pennies per hundred dollars of real estate value. Now the one point one pennies is is if you look at the very next page, it will say extension district and tiny print up in the upper left corner. And on here, there is a line. I want you to scroll down to the far left column and find the line that says real property tax rate actual. 
and then below that is the compensating and then the four percent so if you scroll over to, to 2012 the real property tax rate right now it should say uh, 0 0.0470 so that means that right now we're at 4.7 cents per hundred dollars uh, right below that on the next line is where we where we should be okay this is based on them following the true intent of house bill 44 had the extension district uh, calculated their rates without waiting any of the rates like the personal property and the real property uh, had they not waited those rates this is where we'd be at somewhere between 1.1 cents and 1.14 cents um, and we're wildly outside that so um, putting that into dollars so, so maybe we ought to put compensating plus four seems how it's so wildly less <laughs> we ought to give them the maximum that should be if they didn't wait there if they didn't wait there that's what that that's kind of the range 1. 1. 1. 1. it should be somewhere in between there yeah if they that's chose a four percent rate um they would be at, at one you know 1.14 mm -hmm. if they just chose the compensating they would be at, at 1.10 now the reason that if you if you start back over here in the 2001 column um like in 2001 the actual rate was 1.6 cents you see where it says 0 0.0160 yeah. so we were 1.6 cents it should have been a penny and a half so it's pretty close there um, if you follow with your finger over to the right you'll see mm -hmm. that that the compensating and the four percent rates actually go down each year and the reason that they go down each year is because that's the the proportionate break that we as landowners as taxpayers are supposed to see when our assessments or or our, our, our value or with wealth of our community increases so um, well looking here at some of the data above you know in 2001 there was 714 million dollars worth of property uh, real estate property in Montgomery County in 2001, 714 million. Today there's 1.15 billion dollars. So we've had a, a, a heck of a growth. So since we've grown, our rate should have came down, right. but instead it went up. So that's that's a red flag that their math is wrong. Um, so they're know, compounding their growth. They're increasing in volume and percent. Yeah, so perfect storm. You know, perfect storm scenario. We're, our wealth is going up and the rate, we're paying more in taxes when we're supposed to pay proportionately less in taxes. And the other thing that you might That was the first red flag that I noticed. The other thing you, we all need to know as part of our self-education is the fact that the reason for House Bill 44 was at the time, that's when we had horrendous inflation. And the concern was inflation would cause it so no one could afford to pay their property tax year after year after year because it was going to grow the, the amount that you'd have to pay was going to just explode because of the value of land so the reason why what was said by the legislatures if i'm not mistaken you can correct me if i'm wrong was the reason why they put this in place was to prevent runaway uh, taxes on the part of a taxpayer so compensating was a way for them to regulate down uh, a tremendous uh, increase in inflation by in effect lowering our tax rate so that we just didn't run away with something we couldn't afford and what they did was the exact opposite they ran the numbers away <laughs> they didn't protect the the taxpayer at all they actually just ran wild with the numbers did the opposite yeah, yeah. so um I'm glad so you said that because i was wondering about that yeah it I was there to protect us i graduated from college in 1979 that's a lot of inflation back yes, then. I'm wondering. Yes, that's exactly why they did it, was to protect us against not being able to afford our property taxes year after year after year with wild inflation. That's why they put this damn loan in place, and then they turn around and use it against us. So the 4% was so that they wouldn't, you know, if your property tax this year is $100, you know, you could theoretically expect no more than $104 next, next year, year right? But, but, but I, I, was, I was expecting a 4% increase yes. in my yes. wages. Yes. Yes. That'd be nice. Cost yeah. of living yeah. increases. <laughs> the, 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 the uh, elected officials did a lousy job of having their staff put in the right wording into the law, and the bureaucrats who answered to no one used it in an advantageous way. It happened. It, that, that's that's exactly, exactly right. what they do. Yeah. Yeah. It happens. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's unintended consequences. Yeah. They don't think through the whole policy. But then they don't stop it once it starts. That's that's the problem. So if we go back to page two on the handout, um, the extension service district it's governed by KRS 132.010, which is otherwise known to House as Bill House Bill 44. The outcome, what would the outcome of this be? Uh, the real estate property tax on a $100,000 home 
in Montgomery County would decrease from $47 to $11. That's a pretty good break for people. That's just for the extension service portion. Uh, the personal property tax on a $100,000 business, let's say you have $100,000 in inventory, uh, for instance, would decrease from $122 tax obligation down to $18.90. So that's a, that's a huge drop. Now, and personal property tax for a business, you're talking about a half a million to a million dollars. So yeah, you've got to the extension service. That we've got. This is only yeah, the extension right. service, right. but you can see the, the, the difference in numbers there, and that's after running it through uh, the spreadsheet, which shows what they what the, what they should be had they followed. The that would get people's attention. So so I think that's a good uh, a good wake up call there. Uh, let's skip ahead now to uh, page number. Let's see, that was two of the handout. Three. Let's go to page number four of the handout. It should say revenue in the center at the top and upper left corner extension district. And uh, what this does is this gives us a breakdown on this sheet of um, the normal, and the actual, and the difference. So let's just look at this first. There's kind of like three sets of data on here. Uh, the first set, normal, real, and personal. So we have it broke down. Uh, what's a, what's How much should they have collected if, if it was normal? <laughs> um, you know, so if we go over to fast forward 2012 for uh, real and personal, it had been $127,000 for the real property uh, revenue and uh, $26,000. Uh, for the personal property, um, that's about $153,000 total. It says, it says page two. It's the second spreadsheet behind the extension service. It's the bigger, it's the bigger uh, spreadsheet. Go ahead. Okay, and um, so the actual amounts. Um, what I want to get to here is, is over here in the far right column, you see the number 2.4 million underlined? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and then down below in the second set of data, you see that same number, the 2.4 million again. Uh, and then at the very uh, bottom, bolded numbers, 2.3 million. So the range here of what, in, uh, in my opinion, based on the study, what are the Montgomery County uh, Extension Service District owes taxpayers since 2001 is between the range of $2.3 million and $2.4 million is, is the surplus that they have wrongfully collected from taxpayers had they followed the true intent of House Bill 44. So that's a that's a pretty small range, but but it's a, a big number. You know, 2.3 to 2.4 million, somewhere. You know, let's just give them the benefit of the doubt. Say 2.3 million. Um, Divided by 20, <laughs> 29,000 people, and they're not all property owners, but let's share the wealth. Let's re-spread the wealth. <laughs> but that just kind of shows you, you know, how much was collected in error for the extension district. Now, um, I, I don't propose that we ask them to repay that. You know, uh, they, they uh, are building a new building right now that they're probably spending that um, money, or, or, or probably not all of it, but a portion thereof. And, um, you know, so they probably don't have the money available to repay. I don't think that we should ask for repayment from any of these taxing districts that we're discussing here tonight. I just simply want to make a recommendation, if it's okay with the group, for them to bring their rates down or to work towards a rate deduction, maybe within you know Future. two years, three years, or five years, maybe maybe we discuss it a little bit further, but I think you know we should at least send them a recommendation of you know here's where you are, here's where you should be, had you followed House Bill 44, there's something going on here, or we'd like the, to open it for discussion. Or take the $2.4 million and build a rather large golden cap. <laughs> <laughs> it might take you yeah. a long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> Don't give me the ideas. <laughs> yeah, don't give me the ideas. Don't give me ideas. So that was page four on the handout. We're going to go I, down. Actually, I think that's a very good idea. I think you get more support from yeah. kind of the people who are just casually looking at this if you don't go in and make some demand like that. Right. I think you need to make it clear that they collected that. Well, yeah, too much. But, 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 then but that gives you support right. to say in the future, we're just asking that you make this a reasonable, you know, lower rate. Yeah, we're not asking for repayment. We don't. It's not our, our, our intent to bankrupt any of our taxing districts. You know, we just want to hold them. We want number one to see more more transparent. Number two, we want a, more accountability, um, and we want to be respected. You know, when we come to one of their meetings, we don't yeah. want to be censored. We don't yeah. want to be. If they won't do that. We talk for three minutes. Yeah. If they don't do that, then you got to. I think you have to take dramatic. If you right. know, if a lawsuit happens, then to yeah. pay for the lawsuit, you have to collect from those groups. Okay. So, so what if these districts are have debt? To building new projects or whatever in the same same thing that happens in a in a so private say, yeah same thing happens in a private it's called it's called uh it's restructuring called leadership. restructuring your debt so maybe the ag building goes up for sale yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> that's right mm -hmm. 
I mean, yeah. uh, folks, it, it's it's no different than what we have to do every day. Yeah, that's right. I don't know of any way that I can go to Kroger's or go to Walmart or go to Wendy's or go to McDonald's and say, I gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. <laughs> you can only spend what you have. And if you spend more than what you have, then you have to do something drastic. And what n none of the public special taxing districts have figured out yet is the public has gone through a tremendous contraction and none of them <coughs> have contracted. So they're gonna have to do some things that are tough. I think, I think Shannon's right. You can't go collect that money because except for the library district, none of them have it. We were fortunate that the library had that money in reserves. They were good stewards, in, in my opinion, you know, and, and safeguarded that money, albeit for a larger, newer building, building yeah. that we don't necessarily need. But, right. but at least, you know, and that, and that was our reason for starting with the libraries because they had this big pot of gold of our money, you know. And there was a clear there. law. That's and there was a clear point. law that, that, that they were governed by, you know, a different law than the House Bill 44, which they thought that they were governed by. So that's why we started with the library. Um, it wasn't our intent, you know, to. To, to pick on the library or make this all about the library kind of got drug out here about the library in the beginning but you know we just started with the library now we're addressing the others um, and we are going to tone down you know our, our recommendation proposal whatever you want to call it a little bit in the sense that we're not asking for any repayment we're just asking for more future accountability we're asking for uh, more respect and, and hopefully uh, and you know a bring down a rollback in the rates or a reset in and the rates voice. in time and a voice and, and you know if they say that say well how can we do this you know well you say let us help with your budget yeah. let's give you some recommendations right. we'll go through line by line we'll make yeah. recommendations on and we started doing that with the library and they just you know that it backfired so yeah. but i mean even, <laughs> if, they, not? even if they don't <laughs> make, even, <laughs> even if they don't pay attention you publish it you well, say here's our recommendation let me let me but ask you help. something because you have uh, influence or knowledgeability in frankfurt is there anything that citizens can do for the for the Department of Local Governments and for the uh, library and whatever it's called. The Department thing, of the Library and Archives. About recommending uh, rates that are inaccurate, that are wrong. Well, what you're doing here. You know, but, I I mean, but I mean, but the DLG is providing See, the problem is, is you've got one rates. group of people that yeah. feel protected and can do whatever they yeah. want. Yeah. And you've yep. got these people that have been volunteered to a board yeah. and they're getting this information from bureaucrats that is absolutely misleading and wrong and inappropriate and the problem is like they all say well we give you this stuff but at the very end you're responsible mr. volunteer person once a month for two hours so part of the problem is they they've, they've brought their sheep for the slaughter and they're called our volunteer board because they don't know any different and until Five well, months ago, we didn't. That's what we're doing, like on those issues. We shine a lot. We, we get that out. We get that information out, and then people get that. And they say, I didn't know that was going on, you know, and then they respond. But is there any way to go after the department or local government? Yeah, we're, I mean, it's by making sure people understand what, what's but happening. But is there any way you can scare the hood out? <laughs> yeah, they usually don't want people to know what's going on. That's, okay. that's that's so when we start shining the light, that usually well, DLG Department for Local Government, they they've already you know went on the record you know at our well, at city council the meeting about leaves. about the loophole, and they're well aware exactly. that, about the loophole in House Bill Forty Four. <laughs> um, they came and actually spoke about it. And it's on YouTube if anybody would like to watch it. You know what their comment was um, because the mayor thought that he could hide behind the DLG and come to find out he couldn't. You know DLG said. Well, the city, you have home rule. You know, library, you have home rule. Yeah. Uh, fire, ambulance, all these others, they have home rule, meaning that they, it's up to them what rates they choose. So they maybe the so. Department of Local Government should be the first thing with this span. I don't like the idea well, of the Department of Local Government sending these rates down because the rates are incorrect and they're not right. just sent them to our districts, but all the districts. Right. Well, I mean, you, um, yeah, you, you know, that, like it, we did on the Kentucky League of Cities and the Kentucky Association of Counties, CACO. And these groups that were so corrupt you know you you start telling people what's going on right. those people don't know and that's and that's why there's no momentum a lot of times to change that but if people knew wasteful spending you say why do we need this department what are they doing you start asking these questions what, what do you do how do you serve the taxpayers what's your budget you know and you start getting into this 
And I think that's how you because House Bill because House Bill one did nothing but add five hundred dollars times seventeen hundred districts yeah. to their budget. Yeah, that's true, and we weren't very. The, the House Bill House Bill one, uh, Alec uh, told every special taxing district that they have to pay the Department of Local Government five hundred dollars per taxing district, and there's seventeen hundred in the state. So what happened as a result of House Bill one, which was supposed to give us this transparency and oversight. It didn't do anything for for oversight. It was already being collected, but now they're paid eight hundred and fifty thousand right. more dollars a year. Right. Well, look, look here. That's a, the Department of Local Government is getting about three hundred thousand. I think okay. is the number I was given. And there, some of the districts won't pay anything. Some will pay more but, based on their budget. Right, right. but but, but the website. The, the web. But, but here's here's the step. There was a step taken. It wasn't nearly enough, and there's a lot more that needs to be done. But we, they didn't even know how many of these districts there were for sure. They didn't even know how many there were. And now we know, and now the next step is to start begin to deal with these things. You know, as who's going to drive? Who's going to drive how it's presented? Because yeah. based on the information that you've gathered, Shannon, there's a way of understanding it, and there's a way of clouding it. And I don't know which way the just the local government people are going to put it together, but I would gather. Transparency and the ease of understanding is not the well. It usually uh, isn't. <laughs> so yeah, that's why you need that's why you need groups like ours that do this. We well, we take it. They did put it online. Yeah, yeah but it wasn't. But, but what he, right? They did. Right. But what he's saying is down the road, like the information that comes, are they going to make it, you know, clear where people can really understand I could put, what's going on? I could put I, my I personal it. income tax online for everyone to see. I agree. And I, I could agree. guarantee you wouldn't be able to figure it out. Yeah. 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 Uh, but people can still get back, but you have to be able to get to it first. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I understand. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. I understand. So that's what. Yeah. Since um, when I relayed our, my personal taxes with the library, uh, and you thought that was very clear, and it showed 40% in three years, which changed it for me since I moved here. Um, if, if that struck a chord. Let me suggest something as a way of maybe uh, through the paper, letter to the editor, uh, I'll propose it and uh, we'll tweak it. I, I don't want to hurt the program, but I also need it to be personally um, uh, okay with my uh, presentation of myself to the community. Uh, the, the extension, and I added up the extension uh, System, the library and ambulance added them up. When I got here, it was 484. Last time it was 607. That's a, uh, I, I'm sorry, it was those three. I, I excluded the health and fire because they remained closely the same. But to, to show a, a generalized pub, uh, view for the public to get a hold of, something simple, three of them that have done the most, it, it was a total of uh, 267 raised to 381, which is a 43% and they almost all were 40% like the library. And hundreds of dollars. Uh, 267 dollars for those three on my taxes for the house. Uh, four times, uh, the, the first bill I had, last year it was 381. 267, 380. So almost 20 bucks. Yeah. 33%. Yeah, 43%. Uh, 43%. 43%. Uh, letter to the other just saying, I noticed it and I think that uh, this fair tax group is looking into it and that's why I'm interested in what they have to say and how the money's being spent is really complicated and each budget, of course, has got all kinds of stuff. But maybe just that in the letter to the editor would give a sense that it's simple, it can be explained simply, this increase is huge over a three year change. Uh, that's huge. Well, yeah. is How is that 4%? Yeah. If, yeah. So, if, if somebody thought it wouldn't get lost or misrepresented, I could go back and look at Gateway's personal property tax payments, which would choke you. Yeah, yeah. but then they're going to choke you. There's, I mean, there's people saying that. that but that's based on inventory. That's is, based, based on, on inventory. On. It's not based on revenue, it's yeah. based on inventory. Based on inventory. But now, you would perhaps get the the underneath public response would be 
Well, a bunch Make of rich afford. guys yeah. in their own businesses yeah. where I'm, I'm this retired old man. Right. <laughs> well, the, the, eventually we have to get to the point where personal property tax is a horrible tax because yes. of what they tax. Yes. <laughs> Hurts us all. But I yeah, I think I think, it's I think it's an excellent idea, and and you're you're not a quote uh, name or nemesis. I'm a nemesis. Yeah. Shannon's a nemesis, and neither one of us are a name in this community. And I can claim I'm new here. I like the community. I, 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 you know, a little bit of positive. We yeah. moved here as choice. It's a good place to live. We got a lot of that. And <clears throat> and then say, but I noticed in a few years of, of property taxes. Wow, forty percent. I think you, I think I think you should end your letter with uh, you suggesting that everyone go back and look at your last three years of taxes and see what it's done. And if you want to try to better control this in the future, to come to these meetings, they're they're unassuming, they're not they're not uh, vindictive, they're not. It's not a bunch of crazy guys. It's not a bunch of rich guys. It's a bunch of people that say, wow. Well, you know, in some places, in some states, we know they've, uh, some of our groups have, like, uh, caused people to look at their pay stubs. Yeah. You know, and, and people weren't really noticing, you know, what was being taken out of their, out of their pay stubs. And, and I forgot, there was different innovative ways of getting people to do that. But once they did that, it caused, it caused ch other, uh, sort of a chain reaction on, you know, questions about why is this tax and what is this and what is that? Because eight, yeah. ten, or thirty people is not going to change some of these tough districts. You saw what happened. Like I said, when the law was on our side, it still didn't do it. Mm -hmm. So, so you're going to have to get a bunch of people upset. Yes, or something. And how you get or them upset? Least not, or at least not. Not. Yeah. Well, they'll get upset because they're knowledgeable. Yeah. But like you say, just knowledgeable. Yeah. You know, you don't have to be. You can yeah. just be knowledgeable and say, look, this is not right. This is what the real rate is and what it should be. And look at and everybody's and tax bill sort of came down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And this look at you, and look at your bill. Are you paying more? The most the, the law the years. law's intent was the most we should be paying is a four percent compounded every year. That's right. No, that's the right. most. That's right. The most. And yet we're paying this and this. And Forty-four, that. forty-three. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, so taxes. Nobody thinks they can do anything about it. Yeah. And that's just in one area. When you, I think another key thing here is yeah. when you just look at one area, it doesn't may not look like you know right. a lot, but you start yeah. putting all this together, and it's yeah. it's a but lot. It's easier. hard to do, but another thing you can do, I, I see a lot of people here in the county. Yeah. Another thing you can do is talk about the future. For instance, the uh, subsidies that are going away for your water bill, subsidies are going to go away for your electric bill. Yeah. And what's that going to do to the average that's homeowner it. here in this right. in this county? They're all going to go. Whoa, where'd all the money go? It, it's going to hit them like a brick wall. Yeah. When those, when your bills go up, say we're talking double, yeah. maybe more. Mm -hmm. Your bills go up like that. Your utility bills go up like that. I was told my water bill, like thirty-three dollars a month, should be over a hundred dollars a month. It's bill a month. Yeah. They said the subsidies, if and when they go away, it'll you know triple. We're estimating the electricity rate. rates are going to go up twenty yep. percent in the next few years, and that's a huge without your subsidies, subsidies, federal subsidies, without the, any of the subsidies, and, and, and with with a with a uh, state <coughs> full of coal and none of it being used. Oh, <laughs> 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 well, well, there's going a lot of that is going to be wild. Okay. Kentucky Power was sold to a larger company by the utilities. They promised not to raise That's rate for two yeah. years. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, so what this major utilities are. Yeah. Even yeah. ones that are sitting right on the mouth of the coal mines, they'll more triple what our rates are. Okay, we'll move to the next page, uh, the page that says 2012 Fire District Real Estate Tax Rates. And uh, you see here at the top we have uh, Lawrence County, Woodford County, McCracken, you see some, some of those listed as benchmarks. Uh, Montgomery County, uh, we're currently paying 10 cents for $100 of real estate. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the maximum amount of uh, that their rate can be for real estate is uh, 10 cents per hundred. So we're at the, the state statutory maximum. The recommended rate should be 4.4 cents per hundred dollars of real estate, and uh, that's based on the study. Um, but if you look at the, I believe it's the next two pages, yes. we'll show the uh, the breakdown of where we're at and where we should be at. 
Um, the fire district is governed by KRS 132.010, which is House Bill 44. The outcome of this uh, would mean that the real estate property tax on a $100,000 home would decrease from $100 to $44 annually. And the personal property tax on a $100,000 business with inventory would decrease from $100 to $78 annually. So that'd be a pretty good breaks uh, in taxation for both the, uh, the individual homeowners and also the business owner. Um, you can look at those two pages of the spreadsheets for the data. I would like to pay uh, attention to the, uh, the second, not, not the first spreadsheet, but the second one where it says at the top in the center revenue and it has fire district in the upper left corner. We see some numbers here in the far right columns underlined and bolded. The, uh, the bottom number is gives us the starting point of the range, which is $4.3 million, which was, in my opinion, based on the study wrongfully collected from taxpayers since 2001. And the upper end of that range, right above it, $4.5 million. So the range uh, of $4.3 to $4.5 million, which was wrongfully collected from taxpayers by the Montgomery County Fire District from fiscal year 2001 to present year, fiscal year 2012. This is based on following the true intent of uh, House Bill 44, codified in KRS 132.010. And if you look at that, back in 2001, they were collecting $457,000 in real property tax, and they're now collecting $1.1 million, or oh, 10.1 million. Or, oh, no, that's oh, the, I'm oh, sorry, 1.1 million. 1.1 million. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you're ready to just shoot it's something. Still double. Double. It's still it's double. double. Almost, double. Double. almost triple. There's a lot of numbers. Almost, almost triple. <laughs> yeah. Almost That's what I thought at first too, and I thought I'm like, wow. <laughs> yeah, so 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 they're collected this year. The the fire district collected one point, almost one point three million dollars, um, according to the study. What was normal should have been six hundred and sixteen thousand. So they collected uh, a little more than double what they should have collected this year alone. I mean, That's six hundred and seventy eight thousand dollars just this year. And be ready to be inundated with. We don't even have the proper equipment. It's all old. We can't train anybody. Uh, EPA and and uh, OSHA. And we've already been OSHA won't. Uh, we, we, yeah, we, we can't. No, this is this is. They, they say it's absolutely awful. They don't have any equipment that's that's that suffices. They don't have the broad proper breathing apparatuses. They don't have OSHA approval for this and that and the other thing. And I'm thinking. They, they don't have any other requirements more than any other business. And you just have to figure out how to do it. So one of the things we get on this district is the fact that it was poorly operated for some 15 years and money was wasted. And the guy that finds himself there now is supposedly a very good, trying to do the best he can type person. But the problem is, is that the tax stuff has just increased. You'd think if we went from 450 to almost 1.2, that one thing we shouldn't be complaining about is we don't have the proper, uh -huh. we don't have any reading apparatus. But I don't know where the money went. Well, what do we do going forward? You know, if we're at the statutory limit of 10 cents, I mean, we can't go any higher than that. And that, you know, I mean, God just bid us need more money. I mean, and just so you know, so. people, there's one other thing that you all need to be very well aware of. If you live in Mount Sterling and you have any kind of insurance whatsoever, car insurance, home insurance, personal property insurance, life insurance, or if you're a business and you have uh, uh, product liability insurance or general liability insurance, you pay 11% premium on your insurance. Yeah that goes directly to the city. And that is the highest rate that can be charged for insurance tax. It's the highest one that's allowed. So it's another one that bumped right up against the ceiling. And they don't tell you a thing about it. They don't mention it to you. But if you get a quote from anybody, if you go to some other, let's say a state farm agent in Winchester, you say, want some insurance, and they quote it for you, and then you tell them, well, I live in Montgomery County it will go up by 11 percent. Yeah, you have to uh, point out it was not in the city, otherwise it'll be. Right. Yes, sir. In fact, when I moved, uh, that one of the reasons why Gateway moved outside the city limits mm -hmm. is I was able to save 11 percent 
on two hundred thousand dollar a year premium. Yeah. Jeez. So to reiterate for the uh, fire district, um, they are uh, presently at the maximum amount of ten cents. They should be at four point four cents for real property, somewhere between four point four and four point five seven cents, and uh, they're currently at the uh, the limit for. Uh, personal property, which is 10 cents, they should be somewhere in the range of 7.8 cents to 8.11 cents. And I like to disregard the motor vehicle and the watercraft, those are incorrect. So we'll go to the next page, and that is the, or should be uh, the ambulance. No. I can find it here. The 2012 ambulance district real estate tax rates. Once again, we have some more counties up here for uh, a benchmark. Montgomery currently is at 6.2 cents on our real estate tax rate for the ambulance district. Our recommended rate based on House Bill 44's true intent is 1.37 cents per $100. Um, I would like to note that that would put us the lowest in our state uh, for ambulance. However, um, it's my understanding that there's still a, a great deal of counties without an ambulance property tax. And um, so uh, look at that, how you, you know will. Which ones um, there's a, uh, a PDF I can send you a link to. And uh, some of them, I would, I would imagine, it's rolled up into their general, you know, um, line item. But you got to uh, also understand that we're one of the smallest counties in the state. So by rights, if ambulance is based on distances and mileage and availability, then we shouldn't necessarily expect to be paying anything but one of the lower ones and, because we're not a big county. And in our meeting, we were told, Doug and I were told that, that the amount of reimbursement they received does not cover their expenses. Is that correct? They yeah. said that for medi 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 Medicare, Medicare, Medicaid. Medicare and Medicaid. Medicaid. They said that the amount of money, like if they, if they go and they pick up someone and, and transport them to the hospital, the amount of money that uh, I guess the you state know, or federal government reimburses them yeah, but is they not exactly, enough did they cover their expenses. There are some flaws they, in, the, in the system. Yeah. Because as much money they charge you to deliver you from here to the hospital, Mile, they're gonna cost you two thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Really? Yeah. yeah. They, they, Probably. Yeah. They need to provide alternatives. If you have a, all those exits and if you all okay. have all those transportation, yeah, they should so be. They should well, charge you zero money. Here's what's typically they, they wrong. Okay. Here's what's typically. And I, I know this. I know this because my daughter was. That's the majority of them. My daughter was a. Uh, um, what do you call those people that work on ambulance? Paramedic. Yeah. yeah. Paramedic. She was a yeah. paramedic. Most of the ambulatory activity that we do in Montgomery County, like every other ambulance thing, is non-ambulatory. It's many, many times uh, 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 Medicare, Medicaid, welfare recipients having, having to go, or an older person having to go from a rest home to uh, a hospital for an activity that's not required ambulatory sirens running and so forth so part of the problem is misuse of the thing and there are private companies out there that can do that so if you were to just do ambulatory activities and let it up to a private company because there's there's several large ones in this state you can reduce the amount of that's right. activity you need and and reduce your cost that's a problem all over the state that's mm -hmm. yes and, and, and that's something that needs to happen well, I think Absolutely. when we started, we just had a fire department. I don't, I'm not sure if we had if we've always had the ambulance, have we? I mean, didn't we branch off and create two? All I remember is when they something? transported my two daughters and wife after they got hit by a car in the football after a football game. They they uh, didn't strap my daughter down and they didn't strap my wife properly, and they flew all over the inside of the ambulance from the high school to the hospital. So uh, hey, when they tell me it's really easy. <laughs> Work, I'm going, eh, I don't well, you know. know the I'm taxi sur driver I'm that. surprised the library doesn't do it with the bookmobile since they do everything else. <laughs> <laughs> well, they all do the bookmobile here? Yeah, they do. Yes, yeah, they do. Yes. Yeah. That's good. Going so, to all the preschools for where the people that can't yeah. read? Yeah. Okay. So the outcome here um, is that the real estate property tax on a $100,000 home would decrease from $62 to $13.70, which is what we should be paying. Um, that's per year. So from 62 to 1370, that's a, a pretty good decrease. Jana, do you know, do, you said they collect uh, on the Medicare and things. Do they try and attempt they to They do bill, private? yeah, they do bill. Yeah, from, uh, yeah. They said they bill private insurance, but they just kind of pay them what they want to. Is that what I heard? But they said it, well, it, very, it, yeah. it varies widely. They can only bill so much. They, 
And they try to make it sound like it's reimbursed. not covering their expenses. Now, who's in charge of the ambulance, of ambulance services? The fire chief, chief of one. I just have a question. Have you ever heard of a, any government official saying, please stop sending us money? Yeah. Yeah. We have more than enough. Yeah. We don't need any more. The, the real issue please is the reason us. why these special tax districts have this insular um, feeling about themselves is because we're throwing your grandmother out on the street. We're allowing people to die in the street. <laughs> We're uh, allowing people to be illiterate. Allowing your house to burn down. We're allowing your house <laughs> to burn down. And so so it's an uphill battle. So the, how we approach it yeah. has to be right. And I think the way you approach it is how much money you're actually increased from year to year and what the intent of the law was and what other counties are doing. Your, your culture is, is different. I was amazed when I came here, just I left the Pennsylvania, the Pittsburgh area, when I retired out there, I came down here. But I was in Pennsylvania's highest wealth community, Fox Shop, a suburb of Pittsburgh, and their whole fire company is all volunteer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, they have two paid people to watch the 9 11 telephone numbers, and they had even volunteer EMTs. Now, they did have some EMTs paid. No paid volunteer, uh, fire, no paid fire company. Now, now, get ready for this. Yeah. Our fire chief says that Winchester's all volunteer and they spend more money than we do. So their comeback is that that uh, we're, we're as cheap because they have to train each one of them in the ocean requirement. So it's a lot of bunk. Here's what I say: for every for every public employee that comes off the rolls, we save so much in retirement. Exactly. And benefits here that you right. can't this make. Is, this is unbelievable amount. This is this is. They have forty five. I don't know where it is going. Is it forty five? Right. They have inflation ten percent every year. Forty five. Yeah. Forty five. Forty five, and they have about Maybe twenty. Maybe too, though. And I think they have twenty or so volunteers yeah. in addition. Where are you? Here yeah, it is. Yeah. This is unbelievable. My, my town, my town in Ohio of eight nine thousand <coughs> volunteers is is a hundred percent volunteer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Morehead's volunteer. A lot of very. Well, we, then, we then, then, then you look at the like the number of city police you have here. It's just a, a flood of them. Yeah. Just, man, you know, I'm and not they can't go outside the city limits. No, I understand. Yeah. But I'm just I'm not anti. That, that's that, 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 the city. The city. The city Actually, the, so small. The solution for Montgomery County, and I hate saying this, but the solution for Montgomery County is to have a merged. County city government, yeah, a lot of people, a lot of and, yeah. and everybody is re and, and have responsibilities. You, well, we first we have to have is uh, elected uh, uh, judge executive that would actually control that activity. But if you think about it, here's the real problem: we're, we're kind of sitting in the catbird seat in Mount Sterling because the other smaller towns, mm -hmm. what kind of what kind of voice do they get no. in Montgomery County? Nothing, because I'm starting. That's all you talk about. Well, they probably don't pay as many taxes either. Well, I, 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 I went into the Jefferson area. With a, with a, I said, why wouldn't you have a one deputy on a duty since there is a violence for the for the sheriff who's on duty to go from a duty lane to drive all the way to the Manifest County line? It's almost impossible. If it's a winter, rain, cold, he he can he in it. He drive under the liability. He can kill anybody it, it, because if there is some kind of emergency, he's flying 100 miles an hour through the through the curvy road. It's forever, impossible. Though. I said, why wouldn't you? And I addressed the city last meeting. I said, why wouldn't you address the sheriff? There's nobody to, to talk about because it's 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 like all grouped up and there's yep. they have no they, they have no voice and they have no jurisdiction and they're just it, it, it's so. There's nobody to, no to there's no accountability. There's, there's nobody to no to to ma to suggest or recommend or or, or well, anything. It's just so the absolute out of place. The, the absolute worst part about it is they actually split up the voting capability. You know, even even though Mount Sterling gets one percent or forty percent of the payroll tax that's paid, even though they get forty percent of it, which all comes from workers. In the, county, in the county, in the county, coming and working, and, yeah. we we don't get a say in who's the mayor and it's who's the city council. The occupational, it's an yeah. occupational. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's so, a big so we'll, problem. So we'll talk real quick um, on the uh, donation drive and library litigation. 
And uh, then any other discussion, and we can go ahead and adjourn. Um, right now, we're presently uh, doing a donation drive, so anyone that would like to contribute, um, we would uh, gladly accept at this time. And the, and the uh, money, and the money's used. And the money, money, the money is being used uh, to cover a variety of things. Um, first and foremost, uh, the prioritized uh, thing that we need to cover is a $236. Uh, fee for it's a filing fee for the class action litigation against the Montgomery County Library District. Um, it is uh, actually that covers it right there. <laughs> Ninety one dollars is what we. What and we it's a time and it's a time sensitive activity because if you read in the in the laws, the minute the library signs for that property, the taxpayers are responsible for that debt. So unless we file an injunction to prevent the purchase of that property and file an injunction to withhold the uh, funds that they currently have in excess for not being spent on new property, we, we are risking uh, ineffectiveness because what's gonna pay for the class action suit will be a, a, a not a commission, what do you call it, a, uh, where they? Uh, the refunds. No, they the, do the, the, refunds. The, money, the money that the lawyer's gonna get. Uh, from the refunds. Uh, contingency. contingency. He's going to get a contingency from that money that's reserved. So unless we stop that reserve from going away, we're we're up a creek. I I, I want to I need to go because I'm headed to Florida. So oh, okay. Okay. Uh, so I but I so enjoyed being here. Well, thanks very much for coming. Thanks yeah. a lot. Thanks for what you're doing. Thank Keep you. up the great Thank work. You. Yes, sir. Thank Keep you. up the great work. Really Thank cool you. talk. Let yeah. us know how we can. Help too. Yeah. Thanks for coming. See y'all. So, um, just to give you an update, we were $91 shy as of the night meeting. Our goal for the $236. Uh, the $236 to break that down, it's a $176 filing fee in Montgomery County and a $60 jury demand fee because we'd like a jury trial. So, um, it's $236. That goes direct to the government. <laughs> and um, all, in, all, all of that goes to the government just to start the case. At that time, um, we're gonna turn the case over uh, to Brandon Volker. And uh, Brandon is the attorney that has uh, successfully two. won two judgment summaries in Northern Kentucky and uh, a new one in Boone County is now um, proceeding. They, they ha is, it's just been entered, but, um, but we will be the fourth at this time unless someone else you know files ahead of us. But uh, there's been a, uh, not a, not a, I guess just a judgment summary, not a, not a Sum on summary way. judgment. Summary judgment. Which, uh, and, and it's pretty all that have never done this, and it's only because I've had to fight in court before. The summary judgment is where the two sides say there is no disagreement about what is fact and what is law. And the only thing they're asking for is which interpretation is correct. So a summary judgment is a very strong uh, activity that is hard to overturn in an appeal because an appeal is based on something being done improperly or somebody coming to the wrong conclusion. But the judge looked at the facts of the case and the law and said, this is what it should be. So, so we feel pretty confident this time. That's why we went to the library last week and said, look, you need to drop your rates to three pennies because of the summary judgment. And they decided not to, to ignore us and forget about us. So the, the good news is by using Volker as the, the lawyer, the amount of activity to present the case and the amount of activity to research the case is easy because he's done it twice before. And it's the same lawyer. They're going to use the same lawyer that just lost the, lost the other two cases. Well, they are. Yeah, they, yeah, picked, the, they picked the loser. We picked the winner. already hired the lawyer yes. that, that was in those they two didn't cases. They didn't pick the local one. Yeah. No. Uh, and they're not going, are they going to agree on going to a summary judgment? Uh, well, you have to file the case. So two yeah. other, two other cases were filed, and summary judgments on both those cases were. But they but they're going to agree to go to this without having like a jury trial. They're going well, to you you have to go through all the you have to go yeah, through, go through all the stuff. Okay. Okay. You have to submit your your complaint. You have to submit the facts. Then you then then Volker has to submit a request for summary judgment, and then the losing lawyer team that's but, lost twice before will send his grounds for why it shouldn't be uh, such and then the judge have to make a decision. And now the question is, is we feel more confident that our dis is a district, Di our district judge will come to the same conclusion as the other two because we're not leaders, we're followers, so we have a tendency to believe that district judges, our district judge. I don't know who will hear the case. Is it, yeah, is it? Uh, is it uh, the fellow, is, well, he, I can't think of his name right now, the, the, the male judge. Yeah, I, I, 
It, it used to be Mains a long time ago, and then Mains became yeah. that. Blair? It, it might no, be Blair. Blair. Uh, it sounds right. It's Blair? I think that's right. Blair? 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 Yeah. 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 Pretty good. Yeah, so, so what, what, what we're hoping for is a, a real quick uh, turn on it. Mm -hmm. the, we, we, what we're try, but what we're going to do, we told the library, if you agree to go down to three cents, you can save the money that you have, just like Use Shannon's doing now, to help uh, reduce your, your immediate shortfall and, and get yourself back in line. When we go to, when we go to the court, we're going to ask for that money back. Mm -hmm. And the part of that is to pay for the lot. lot. I feel it's possible. Awesome, I think it was my wife who said. Well, I just checked in now. <coughs> I think it's my wife who said who's a big supporter through the Houston Library, but uh, I think so they waste some money down there. But she's saying it seems foolish for them to go to court because they've already got a couple of precedents. And I said, well, they're saying it's not precedent, yeah. though. Yeah, okay, but people in the library board are not going to put it, take it out of their pocket and pay. Right, it. it's our money. Yeah, right. That's right. And sad to see that, but that's why we offer yeah. two different yeah. compromises. And that's why we try to be very reasonable. Yeah. Considering that we got no respect whatsoever, I thought we really bent over backwards trying to get them to see the light. Uh, but we, we had a sneaky suspicion that they would ignore us. So with this $100 donation here, it uh, puts us, if we meet that benchmark of $91, and um, the other uh, things that we're putting the excess towards um, will be to cover the, uh, we do some voice dialing, you know, reminders about the meeting. Uh, Checks payable to the Citizens for Fair Taxation. And um, we're not a, 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 we're um, yes, it's uh, there's you can go to taxlesssociety.com forward slash donate and you can donate on there as well online through PayPal. Um, but this essentially, like I said, all these funds that we collect are all being used just to feed this initiative, um, you know, through copies being made, postage. Uh, it was several hundred dollars just to get the word out for our first meeting. You know, in postage, we sent out a few hundred letters um, in the community to the top taxpayers, and business owners. Uh, factory owners and such, and uh, you know, to, to really to, to, to launch the initiative. Um, so there was, you know, there's been expense along the way, but we're just now really going into fund, fundraising mode, uh, mostly, like I said, for the litigation. But uh, but any excess will be used responsibly and uh, solely for this initiative. So um, on that note, any other further discussion? Um, uh, I added up the extension service, fire, and ambulance calculations. Either current and uh, where they should be, where they where they should be. Now, is it accurate to say that they should be there according to KRS one thirty two zero intent? The intent, the intent, the intent. Okay. intent. But, but not according to compensating plus four. Well, the compensating no, plus four. No, compensating plus four is there also. Okay. He has both comp. And I, what I would do to to soften it, although it doesn't do much to soften it, is to to tell. It's going to be very hard for the public to realize that might be better keeping the rate... Not even to mention the KRS statute. Just keep it very, you okay. know, maybe not yeah. even get that, into that. that. The, okay. intent, the, intent, the intent of the law was to, your to increase... Is what I would say. It's my understanding. Yeah. yeah. Because, and the reason why is to say compensating says that the only thing we're going to depend upon is new property, okay? Which in the case of Montgomery County should be enough. You saw the numbers that showed it. Okay. But to be the most bendable, flexible, whatever you want to say, compensating plus four should maximize what the intent of the law said they were supposed to be able to do. Okay. And it's compensating plus four percent of the revenue. It's not the rate. Okay. Okay. Well, now the four percent, the four percent. 209 down to 69. I think that that figure <laughs> is yeah. big enough yeah. for an individual 100,000 on a home before people say, oh, well, that's big. Yeah, yeah, it's real big. Um, well, I'll, I'll craft the letter and send it around. It okay, I hope will be something simple, something personal, yeah. but also buy in to the crew. Monday, five p.m. And you can approach four fifty-eight because I. <laughs> what is one? Well, that's the cutoff time for a letter to the editor. Oh, yeah, you want to write a letter to the editor. Yeah. Do we anticipate more lawsuits? Um, no, I mean, I, I don't see any, you know. Now, now the, only, the only thing you might have is a, you, we might wind up having to do a recall 
if you have well, an appeal. You, probably the library. Brandon seems to think there's going to be an, it's going to be appeal in either way. That either we're going to appeal or the library's going to appeal. So if, you know, if there's appeal, I don't know how that. I guess we we'll have to pay another filing fee for an appeal. Well, it depends on who's appealing. Who's appealing? I mean, if they appeal. We, but but the other districts. But the other if we districts. We would lose this first round. We would oh. appeal it. Okay. Yeah. Um, but the other but the other, the other districts, districts. If you're talking about the other districts, uh, I would say the probably the appealing those more than likely what would have to be would be a recall vote, where we ask for a, a recall of of the uh, tax assessed on us, which is how you're supposed to be able to um, uh, appeal. If they raise their rates too high, I'm not high, even sure we can. We're even eligible for that. Well, I think we are because of the problem with the law and the fact that anybody that has a pencil can figure out that. But who would we have to go to for that? The fiscal court isn't going to back us on that. I don't believe. I mean, they. they uh, pretty much made it clear it depends that they on how much ball. ruckus is going but, on. But you're anticipating even if you win this round that the library board will appeal it. Right? Yes, yes, but 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 right. but but as a as a class action. It's not as it's not as um, wearing heavy on us. What you're doing, yeah, you might as well face it. You might as well face it. Let's suppose that there's a million dollars in reserve at the library. Most likely, Brian Volker will get probably somewhere between a hundred and three hundred thousand dollars for doing this. Whew. He's looking at up thirty seventy class actions. Yeah, thirty. Thirty. You know, ten to thirty percent. That's what? typically of, of 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 probably that reserve. Whoa. Whoa. But did you talk you to him about that? I hadn't talked. No, to him. I hadn't talked to him. But but I, I talked to my lawyer about what contingencies typically are. Ten to thirty percent. Yeah. So and maybe with a maybe with a class action, maybe it's a little lower because when you gather all those people up, you don't need as much. But if you remember when when uh, what's his face sued uh, that uh, weight loss company that caused all sorts of heart problems, how many? Millions and millions of dollars did they get? Because one of the things I need, I need to discuss before we do it is, would anybody here want to be a plaintiff in the in the case? And uh, I mean, I'm volunteering. I mean, I'll be the first one to come forward. Uh, I'd like to have three people, you know, uh, be, be listed. I mean, just so it's not Shannon versus the library. <laughs> um, but I mean, no pressure. I mean, you know, if you want, I, to I'll sign. I, if you're asking for signatures on the on the lawsuit, uh, I'll sign. Okay, I don't mind. I think they need and three signatures on the to make it a class action. Now, I'm not sure about that. I mean, yeah, we, we haven't heard. We'll find out. Brandon's on. Brandon's out of town right now, so he's okay. in uh, Hilton Head, I think, on vacation, and we've got some questions to ask him. But um, that's our next step: is to start that the, the litigation, hand it over to him, let him handle the library. Um, at this time, I don't anticipate any other, you know, lawsuits against the others. Um, just simply asking for more. Transparency and accountability going forward. Would, would it be simple for, for, for him to write a letter to the address the library before he, uh, the, we enter into the, the, the lawsuit? The, the library is not listening. They, would, it, would it be interesting? They're a, well, they're, they're not interested because they have a traditional bank on their side. All the money, school money, library money, extension money, it's all in traditional bank. Traditional bank, White Pack Carrington is in charge of their control courthouse. So it's pretty much all the one, one system. So that's why they don't, they don't really care about your lawsuit. Well, they, you'll make up because all the judges. I hate to see the money wasted. Well, all the judges money the wasted. Hands, absolutely. The tax, oh, the the tax tax payers, big family. The taxpayers will get back more than most likely what Brandon charges in one year. Yeah, absolutely. Based on going back, rolling back to three pennies. Now they're going to make it sound like we're, we're abusing taxpayer money, and I don't think it's an abuse. I think they're stopping the bleeding. They're, they're, they're abusing the library, it by not cooperating. Library clearly, clearly told you last time. If there's a new, new building, I'm out. So she will fight to the death for her position. Right. Yeah. And with them deferring these things like the leaky roof, not putting money into fixing the leaky it's, roof, it's all it's, it's like the antenna. Why doing, would you put new tires on a car? I mean, you pay right the, you pay every year. She probably pay about four or five thousand dollars liability insurance for that building, and she's not using it to cover the roof. Yeah. <laughs> and she's she's a blaming that there is a roof leaking while we need to put a new building on it? Well, the new building is going to have a new roof. We need to put a new roof. No, no, they're not even buying a new building. They're buying a different building. That's older than yeah, the one. which is older than the one that they're, that they're in it's, 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 it's The just, excuses she started giving right. is like, it's a, right. I mean, right. I'm not an educated person, but it's, it's a childish The game library does not think that we will, that we will file a suit. 
because we were very clear to them. We asked them and asked them and asked them. And they and here's what one of the things they said. Look, you know, I said, but you know, two two counties, the judges filed a summary, and I again went through that explanation. It's a really strong thing for a summary judgment. And they said, look, we submit our budget and we're gonna submit it where it is right now, and we can change it if we have to. I said, Well, if you can change it if you have to, why don't you put it at three pennies and we'll go away? And if the law gets overturned, then you can go and change it back to whatever you wanted to. They wouldn't do that either. So what we tried to do was appease us. <coughs> if, it, if it doesn't mean anything to you, appease us between now and September. They wouldn't do it. The new chairman of your library board, though, uh, has access to a pretty good council there. So, uh, yeah. yeah. But they didn't use that council. They used the now loser the of the council, lawsuit. Yeah. Well, you, but, you know, the, yeah, White Perry. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of... Uh, yeah. Sort of stuff going on. A, lot, a lot of influence. There's a lot of names in there. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the million dollars, uh, the one they have in the budget, in the excess, where does it sit? Traditional bank. Where, the school money, they had a six million dollars, where does it sit? Traditional bank. All the accounts were there? All ties to one location. But traditional does get the bid every year on school money. And that is put out for bid, at least every couple of years. I think yeah. every year. They pay interest on it? Uh, or the yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah. you want to call it that yeah. anymore. Money that's invested in the checking account, but then the money that's invested, they, uh, they, and you, you, the, the investment money is not all traditional, but it is all very conservative investments for the, the school district. Yeah. All gateways money is in traditional. But that, that, that money is so flows so because yeah. the school district I'm paying them in interest. <laughs> <laughs> so am I. Your parents. I pay them $140,000 a year <laughs> for the other discussion or to give them my money. Make a motion to adjourn. All right. Thank you.